Hey guys, it's Gala Avery from the Video Archives podcast. While we're shuffling tapes and gearing up for season two, Quentin and Roger have sent me on a mission all around Los Angeles and beyond to talk with filmmakers, photographers, VHS collectors, and other interesting characters. What are we going to be talking about? Well, that's up for my guests to decide. On The Gala Show, guests have 30 minutes to talk about whatever topic they want you to know about. Filmmakers like Josh Miller will tell us how he found his tribe, while writers like Larry Karaszewski will let you know what he considers to be a true L.A. movie. VHS collectors like Connor Holt make an argument for the genre of pirate movies, while writers like Josh Olson are going to let us in on what he considers to be right-wing cinema. Actors like Percy Hines White will share his love of outsider art, while animators and cartoonist Sierra Nielli will reminisce on his experiences of growing up in a Philly pizza shop and how this time in his life influenced him to pick up a pencil. So, join me every Thursday for a new guest with an entirely new topic. The Gala Show premieres October 26th, available wherever you get your podcasts. On this episode of the Video Archives podcast, Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery take a trip to Boston Memorial Hospital for Michael Crichton's coma. People are falling into comas after routine procedures, and it's up to one doctor to uncover the mystery. Roger and Quentin discuss a main character overcoming chauvinistic expectations and go in-depth on Crichton as a writer and director. Next, we'll travel to the streets of Philly for Elaine May's Mikey and Nikki. A small-time bookie has stolen mob money and is in hiding. The only person he can depend on is his childhood friend. A tale with a supreme split and reversal, Roger and Quentin unravel the mystery of why Elaine May chose to make this film. Lastly, we'll travel down the river with Joe Dante's Piranha. Piranhas designed to survive in both fresh and salt water are released into a river, and they're hungry for little chubby legs. Roger and Quentin talk about how big studios diving into the exploitation market affected the genre, and the balance between comedy and humanity that only Joe Dante can bring to a movie. And here they are now. Here's Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery. Thank you very much, Gala, for Thanks, that Gala. introduction. Okay, kill the buckle off. And welcome back to another exciting episode of the Video Archives podcast. I'm Quentin Tarantino. And I am Roger Avery. And we're dealing with three movies today, our normal way of one double feature and then kind of a, a third one. Yeah, like a, yeah, attached. A, at the a, end. a special, a very special monkey in the middle. Yes, exactly. If you were at a, a grindhouse or a drive-in, you would decide whether or not you stayed for the third movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you are more than entitled to do that on listening to this podcast. Um, one thing I will say about uh, two of the movies that we're going to be talking about, uh, Coma and Mikey and Nikki, is it's almost impossible to talk about them in any kind of uh, analysis kind of way without giving away uh, at least some of the the pleasures of the movie narratively. So I would say that this is an episode that if you really want to see uh, a coma and especially Mikey and Nikki, uh, you should probably watch it before you hear our episode. I mean, even reading the back of the box for Mikey and Nikki will, will ruin some of the narrative pleasures that I think the movie has to offer. Uh, so I don't normally say that on this one, though. We're not going to give away too much stuff in coma, but to actually really talk about it, mm-hmm. you need to kind of reveal some things that, frankly, it would be better not if you intend to watch the movie, it would be better not revealed by us. We'll try not to, but it may happen. It will happen. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. <laughs> At Boston Memorial Hospital, only one doctor can save your life. But first, she's got to save her own. This is real, Mark. Somebody is putting people into comas. Somebody's seen too much. Somebody's gone too far. Somebody's getting away with murder. Coma, rated PG. The first film that we used from the uh, Video Archives collection, Coma is normally kept in the drama section. Yeah. It was not in the horror section. When Gala was looking it up earlier in the big book, uh, the database book, uh, she was like, where is it? And I said, well, I think drama, yeah. because that's where we always had it, because it really moved out of drama with all with yeah. Michael Douglas and Jean-Pierre Bigeau. Its foot could fall into... Like frankly, to tell you the truth, not only the horror camp, it, 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 its its big toe crosses over into science fiction. Sure, but at the end of the day, I think it's most effective. 
as a thriller. Yeah. And it was super timely. Yeah, well. it was very timely at the time. And it's a beautiful MGM UA uh, box. I love their boxes. Big, one of the big square ones. It's really terrific. And I'm going to read the back of the box. The it film was directed by Michael Crichton. Oddly enough, um, not based on a book that he wrote. It's uh, one of the rare times that he, uh, I think the only time he actually did somebody else's, uh, a book based on somebody else's novel, even though he did the screenplay. Yeah. And, and the, it was a very popular novel at the time. Uh, Robin Cook uh, wrote it. In fact, not it, was, only, it was huge. The novel came out and boom, into production immediately. Yeah, almost. I mean, not only, oh, actually, not only was Coma such a big novel, Coma to some degree or another started an entire subgenre in, in fiction of a, uh, uh, Hospital thrillers, yeah, or medical thrillers. Brian De Palma's father, a doctor, writes medical thrillers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I remember Coma was actually one of those books in the seventies that got its own commercial on TV. Yeah, yeah, it was a way like a year before the movie came out. Yeah, you always you had that image of the of the bodies hanging from the wires because of they had the famous. Yeah, my book, memory book commercial. was everybody had this book. Yeah. Like we had the book. You'd go over to somebody's house. They had the book. I remember seeing this book everywhere when I was young. Well, I remember all the, I remember all the, the, the bestsellers that actually got commercials that were played almost like a trailer for the- uh, And they would shoot their own commercial stuff. Yeah. So anyway, this is Coma. Uh, movie stars uh, Jean-Bierre Bougeau and Michael Douglas, uh, uh, as well as Elizabeth Ashley, Rip Torn, and Richard Widmark. And I shall now read the back of the box. Jean-Bierre Bougeau and Michael Douglas star in an exciting contemporary thriller, the film version of the best-selling Robin Cook novel where every split second can mean the difference between life and living death. Few stories have caused the sensation that Coma has with its deep, probing questions into the medical mysteries of our time. Now the movie, directed by Michael Crichton, throws open the doors to the secret research going on inside the private labs. Brilliant co-stars Richard Widmark, Elizabeth Ashley, and Rip Torn bring to the screen all the suspense of the novel. See how they're really hitting the novel, I think? Yeah. Jean-Bierre Bougeau, as Dr. Susan Wheeler, suspects that someone is purposely murdering patients at the hospital. Healthy young people undergoing routine operations are slipping into irreversible comas. There is no pattern to the incidents. Yet... She becomes obsessed with proving that the hospital is responsible, even when it puts her own life in danger. Michael Douglas, the talented actor and producer, plays her lover, a young doctor who is never sure whether his friend is onto something or just cracking up. The tension builds throughout the entire film until the final climactic stroke of the scalpel in a pulse-pumping finish. That's actually a pretty good description. <laughs> yeah, it sells it. So I'll just sort of like reiterate their version of, of, of the plot just to get us talking about the film in general, is the idea of the film is Jean-Bierre Bougeau is a young doctor, a young resident in a hospital, I believe in her very first year yeah. as a resident. And her lover is um, Michael Douglas, who's like her, uh, they're not living boyfriend. Are they living? No, they're, no, no, no. She has her own place. She has her own place, yeah. But they're, but they're, she's staying at his place a lot. She's got a drawer. Yeah, exactly. She keeps her toothbrush there, stuff like that. Yeah, he's a resident. I think he's about like maybe five or six years ahead of her. And he's online to maybe really be a big shot in the hospital. There's a, there's an upcoming vacancy that he might very well be the one uh, getting. And there's a, a big point made that he's a very political animal. Yeah. He knows the right people to wine and dine and the white people people to have lunch with and the right, you know, just the, the, the right things to do that when, when openings come up to advance his career, he is one of the people thought of. Yeah. He's not there for the Hippocratic Oath. Yeah. He's there to, to advance himself. I wouldn't go so far as to <laughs> uh, uh, well, question his motives for being in medicine, say, but you know, he wants to rise. He, he doesn't just want to be a, he just doesn't want to be a doctor. He wants to be running this place. You said at the forefront, mm -hmm. that's the forefront. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath is the back burner. <laughs> yeah. In the story, one of uh, uh, jean bierre Bougeot's uh, really good friends, played by Lois Child, uh, who, who Moonraker. We remember, uh, we remember from Let's Moonraker. Let's talk about Moonraker for a while <laughs> now that we've uh, got Lois Child. So, I was so happy to see her show up here. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm always happy to see her. Show I love up. Lois I like, Child. I, I like Lois Child as well. And she's a, a married woman who was having an affair that her husband doesn't know about. And in the course of the affair, she got pregnant. And so she's basically, she's getting like a, a simple abortion that will take care of the baby and her husband will be none the wiser. 
because of the <clears throat> because of it. And so she talks with um, Jean Bier Bougeau about it, and she's admits that she's a little nervous. And she goes, "It's it's totally safe, right? It's a routine procedure. It's a routine procedure." And uh, Jean Bier Bougeau, well, yeah, well, look, any time you do you go under the knife, there is a slight risk. But no, this is a re- it's this is completely routine. You're, you're it's absolutely fine. Your husband won't know. Uh, you'll be fine. It's just fine. Don't worry about it. You know, trust me. Don't worry about it. And so she goes in to get the abortion, and uh, she's put under. And then they're not able to bring her out of the anesthesia, and she's you know she's her eyes become fixed and dilated. Yeah, the guy says, and that's it. She's that's it. She's and it's irreversible. There's no coming back from that. Her brain is too fucked up now. So they send her off to the Jefferson Institute. For- yeah. So. Jean Bia Bougeau, this is like a friend of hers. So she's like, whoa, this doesn't make any sense. And so, so, so she's asking all these questions and she's, you know, uh, 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 poking her nose into this. And then all the doctors, including her boyfriend, Michael Douglas, are saying, look, we know, yes, it's absolutely tragic, but you know that these things happen. There is a- yeah, We have thousands you know, and thousands of people coming through this hospital every yeah, day yeah. and, you know, somebody's going to die is, every there, now and then. There is, a re- there is a reality of anesthesia and uh, uh, one out of a thousand uh, respond badly to them and it can make something like this happen. It It, it is one in a thousand, but it, there is that one. And apparently she was that one. It just, it just happened. She keeps trying to stick her nose into more, but they keep discouraging it. Then she sees it happen a second time, like the very next day to a patient. And the patient just happens to be Tom Selleck, which is frankly one of the best pieces of casting in the entire movie. Yeah. Because he's playing a. It's not only, it's not, yeah, he's playing an athlete who hurt his leg and he's, he's got to no. get a, something done into his knee. All right. Um, but the thing about it is, it's not just that he looks exactly like Tom Selleck. So it's not like, it's not like, Terminal Island Tom Selleck, where he doesn't quite look like Tom <laughs> Selleck yet. Or uh, 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 Myra Breckenridge Tom Selleck. No, this is Magnum P.I. two years before Magnum P.I. He looks like the epitome of health. Yeah, he, well, he, he is he, the epitome he, of he health. He is health personified. He's, he's Tom Selleck. <laughs> he is health personified. So when you see him and he's all charming and he's handsome and he's sitting in the bed and he's talking about the minor operation on his leg. And then three hours later and you see him and he's, you know, for all intents and purposes, dead. It's like, it's actually, it's powerful. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's shocking. And she's like, whoa, whoa, yeah, how could whoa. This guy who's in perfect health. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So then she starts doing the thing that I like. Uh, uh, I like when female characters and thrillers do. She starts becoming Nancy Drew. and She starts yeah. investigating what's going on here, which leads her to the facility that they, the Jefferson uh, Institute, the Jefferson Institute, which leads to the facility where they are sending these coma patients and these for, for long term care for long term care, and it's a very futuristic, uh, brutalist uh, kind of facility out of a Cronenberg movie. Right now, part of the thing, way the movie works is she thinks there's a conspiracy. So she's trying to prove it. Everybody else is telling her that she's wrong. And not only is she wrong, she's being wrong like an hysterical woman. She's jumping to massive conclusions and, when you uh, go she, to and the, she's overreacting and she's being too emotional. When you go to the head of anesthesiology, who is Rip Torn, and you start saying, hey, let me go over all of your uh, files. I'm going to like investigate all this stuff. He's insulted by that. Yeah. He's like, what the? F- no. It's actually one of my favorite lines in the movie. Goes, would you mind if I went over your research? Yes, I would mind. I would mind very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do mind. <laughs> yeah, so she's pissing people off in a big way. And also during a time mm-hmm. when it's sort of like, you know, honey, sit down mm-hmm. yeah. is kind of the attitude. But now the thing is, okay, she thinks there might be something going on in here and trying to figure it out. And they're all telling her, there's not. We know there's something going on because we paid to see a movie called Coma. And we know that, the, you know, we know she's going to be right. We know that there is a, a a cabal at work here, that there's a conspiracy at work. And we're just hoping she doesn't get killed finding it out. We don't know the particulars of it, but we- But we do know We that, know that some kind of crazy stuff yeah, is going on. Because it's a movie, we know <laughs> that she's correct. And also the poster, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very sinister looking. Yeah. So we're waiting to see- how far it goes, who's involved, and uh, will she get out of this with, with her skin intact? 
I saw this the opening night. I saw this at the uh, De La Maman, the big low cinema, the Friday it opened. All right, at, at the 7.30 show, too. Yeah. So I, I was there for that evening show. And this was a smash hit. So I was there on that smash opening weekend. So I knew what I felt about the movie. You had never seen it until this screening. That's correct. So this, what did you think of it? Okay, so um, at the time, I was young enough that this just didn't appeal to me. I mean, the concept of it appealed to me. But I, And I even think that at Archives, I think we popped it on mm -hmm. once or twice in the store. Mm -hmm. And it would play. There is the thriller element that is, I think, absolutely great because by by the end of the movie, when everybody's running around, jean vier Bougeot, I think somebody here actually said this earlier, jean vier Bougeot is like an action star. Yeah. Oh, she is fantastic. Now, this is a French-Canadian mm -hmm. uh, girl. Anne of a Thousand Days. <laughs> yeah, Anne of a Thousand Days. You know, uh, I knew her from- You knew her from Earthquake. Well, well er, of course. Uh, I knew her from Earthquake. I also knew her from King of Hearts, which is oh, okay. like one of my very favorite movies. I hope we watch yes. someday here. The week after Coma hit, it was such a smash that jean bierre Bougeot was on the cover of People magazine. We're like, oh, jean bierre Bougeot, star of the new movie, uh, uh, Coma, uh, this wonderful actress has finally, you know, found the right commercial hit. And I remember even buying the People magazine because uh, I liked the, I liked the, I, I liked her. I liked the picture of her on the cover, and I read the article. I thought maybe I might still have it, but I don't. <laughs> no, I'm really, really glad I didn't see the movie until until I am the person I am now, which is mm -hmm. grown up Roger. Because mm -hmm. I think young Roger just wouldn't have been prepared. To, to look at the movie this way or to understand the movie this way, mm -hmm. because um, there is the thriller elements, which are great. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, makes the movie just fun to watch. And, and it like, it moves also. Mm -hmm. It's like, it has a great pace. I, I actually think it's kind of hands down Michael Crichton's best directing. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that. It's really... I, mean, I, I, like, I like Looker, but I'm not, not, be, not, not because it's so well-directed. <laughs> I'm not putting down the other film. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I think his... I mean, well, this his one, direction here is just... It's, 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 it's serving the movie completely. It's just seamless, and it just moves. And, and I think maybe back then when it came out, I might have wanted more of a De Palma flourish in my thrillers yeah. set pieces but i don't think I, but i didn't i i i didn't need that at all watching it uh, this time i actually just i just actually appreciated it's just uh, uh um effectiveness yeah it's completely effective now what i would not have been equipped to read and comprehend out of this movie was all of the discussions and how the entire movie is built on like the plot of the movie is the the thriller aspect the story of the film mm. is all these conversations about the gender issues that were going on at the time, the battle of the sexes that was going on at the time, the mm -hmm. uh, um, the Billy Jean King, Bobby Riggs mm -hmm. thing that had happened the years before, when, just when this book was probably written, mm -hmm. and from the very first scene in that apartment mm -hmm. when they're talking, it's all about it's all about their position, mm -hmm. you know, their societal positions. Well, it is. and 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 his expectations yeah. of her as a woman, uh -huh. and his kind of not even taking her fully seriously and kind of like his expectation that she's going to serve him. There is that in this there movie. There is that, but it's not actually, but there is that in this movie, but there are times in the movie, and I think this is one of the neat things about the screenplay, is that, yes, she feels that oftentimes in the movie, but the movie doesn't always say she's right. No, no, it doesn't. It does, But you don't have to always be right to, no, be, no, to, to, be, to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And everyone she goes to, from Michael Douglas, her boyfriend, to, um, uh, is it Richard Widmark? Yeah. Uh, um, playing the head of the hospital, yeah. who, uh, who almost starts, like, uncomfortably touching her in weird it's, ways. It's very, it's very Joe Biden. -y. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If he had, if he had leaned over but and like, sniffed her, it would have like, been, but you know fully. what? I gotta look, I gotta say, I gotta say, yeah, I noticed that now. I didn't notice that back in the 70s no, and, when I and watched you don't it. Have, and you don't have to notice it, but it's one of the strong <laughs> things that I think is so great about the movie because mm -hmm. it, there is, there is a moment where it's, thematically presented where mm -hmm. she's trying to solve the problem and she's found a clue and she's gone into the depths of the hospital mm -hmm. and she's climbing this uh, no, access ladder. shaft yeah, yeah, or something, yeah. this ladder in the, in the bowels of the hospital that goes up like mm -hmm. five stories, mm -hmm. this ladder and she's climbing it and she gets to the top and she has to like get over into this like little mm -hmm. access tunnel off. Well, she has to side. kick her shoes off in order to do what she has. Then she has to take she, her pantyhose well, that's, off. That's, yeah, and that's yeah, what yeah. I'm getting at. Yeah, okay. She drops her shoes and she sheds her feminine mm -hmm 
artifice. Mm-hmm. Like the, in fact, yeah. the the shit that men expect her to wear. Yeah, she kicks those off, and that allows her to continue on her journey. Mm-hmm. And Crichton, I think, handles that like amazingly well, subtly. There's there's another there's another moment. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is um, O R eight means orate. Mm-hmm. Like it's the word orate, which is to speak pompously, which is I think <laughs> what all the men are doing in this movie. Oh, very much pompously so. about themselves, thinking about themselves. It's like uh, there's like no, also, that's very true. There's many subtle word plays like that going on through the movie. I think the script is really dynamite. Look, the script the script is really good. Uh, I think there are some holes in the story, some big holes. Uh, however, there's a far fewer holes that are in a Michael Crichton's <laughs> novel. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's always just perplexed me about Michael Crichton, um, Michael Crichton might be the smartest person who ever was a Directors Guild member. I mean, he maybe has a higher intelligence. And a Writers Guild member. Yeah. And he, probably a Producers Guild member. Okay, well, writers can be smart. <laughs> Directors aren't always the smartest guys in the world. All right. Uh, 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 the things in his Fantasias that he's able to sell that nobody else could sell is absolutely gobsmacking. Equally gobsmacking is the incredible plot holes <laughs> that the most untalented hack could have puttied over. And he just leaves exposed all out there for the world to see. Um, you throw lo- one out. Looker is the perfect example because nothing that. simple in the movie works at all. Everything about the movie just doesn't, nothing about it makes sense. What From the point of view of- <laughs> We're going to replace models digitally why they and fe- Why them. they feel they need to <laughs> take actresses who are happy to act for you. No, we need to replace them with digital avatars and then let's kill them for whatever reason. It's never explained why that's a good idea. No. That's Those are the big ideas. Albert Finney has to get from A to B and then C and then eventually get to D. And none of it is convincing. It's all just complete coincidence. And they're just like gaping, gaping plot holes. The simplest shit that a TV scrib could write on a Mannix episode (laughs) is just beyond Michael Crichton. On the other hand... He introduces a ray gun that has never existed before yeah. and will probably never exist. And it's the most convincing thing in yeah. the fucking movie. It's so <laughs> brilliant. In fact, it's so brilliant. It makes the movie. It makes the it movie. It props everything up. It, it's the reason you watch Looker oh, is yeah. for the ray gun yeah. that they shoot. And uh, even v- the effects of v- the ray gun <laughs> on Albert Finney are convincing. Oh, well, I guess the, that's probably what would happen if you got shot well, with that ray he's gun. Driving in his car and and then suddenly he's sitting in the fountain oh, in yeah. his car. <laughs> the ray gun scenes are the whole fucking movie. That's why you watch Looker. All right. Yeah, I love okay. Looker. Yeah, and, and to see James Coburn look like a shark. All yeah. right. Just, Susan Day's not bad. No, I like Susan. I've always liked Susan Day. Yeah, yeah but it's a, you know, but but that's all of his movies. And I have to say, there is an aspect of that in coma uh as well. Uh there is a middle section. In coma, that is absolutely ridiculous. Just absolutely ridiculous and absolutely absurd. And it's it's in there just to add a big action scene to keep everything uh, keep everything going and to keep uh, Jean Bierre Bougeot's character in, in in peril. Basically, she's asking too many questions. We know that there's a conspiracy going on. Uh, but we don't know exactly who's involved, but we know somebody's involved. And so these somebodies send an assassin after her. <laughs> okay, and now the assassin is running all over the hospital and there's one janitor that's kind of maybe figured out something and she's going to go talk to him. The assassin kills the janitor and now he's chasing her all around the hospital trying to kill her. Now, okay, so let's go to my exactly one of my problems of this uh, is. Okay, one, I have a problem with it uh, conceptually and I have a problem with it practically as far as how it works as a scene. One, I never, ever, 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 ever buy these little conspiracies of people that when something starts happening, they go out and they 
send an assassin as if they have this brotherhood of assassins that work for them. Who is this guy? How did they hire him? You know, where did he come from? Well, he came from movie assassin world. That's where he came from. Uh, why would these doctors actually let, like, an assassin be part of their thing to get in the way of all of this? Uh, uh, it seems like he would be the easiest guy for the cops to find and have him drop dime on all of them. It, it's, just, it's just a movie conceit that nobody asks questions about, and I don't buy it. But to add to... How ridiculous the assassin situation is in coma is to see how realistic the assassination situation <laughs> is in Mikey and Nikki yeah. when we talk yeah, about Yeah, we'll get back now, to that. Now, that is how a real hitman would be. Yeah. That has... Ned Beatty's It character. almost has the, uh, the stink of authenticity. It yeah. seems so, so real. That just proves how fanciful the coma situation is of these organizations that have brotherhoods of assassins well, that just do their bidding. You don't have to go so far. You can just go to that coma institute, the Jefferson Institute, and with that fact that everybody's hanging by wires <laughs> like from the ceiling. That's- no, but I buy all that, though. This I don't buy I, I, I don't buy the imaginary assassin creed that, that the, I mean, how much does he get paid? What's the situation? Has he killed other people for them before? You've never is hired a, an assassin? Is this, a, is this a one-time thing? Or is, is he part of the organization? How much does he know? Seems like he knows a lot. Okay, so that's my problem with the entire concept of the assassin. Then the scene plays out. And it's the most absurd fucking thing in the movie. I cannot believe this is a hospital that is open for business. (laughs) It's in the middle of the night. There's a lot of people in this hospital. This could not be more of a public place. It's also a huge hospital. Granted. For what it's worth. We will say that in this situation, at this time of night, in whatever floor up up above in the hospital she is, that there's nobody on those two or three floors. Yeah. And the assassin is chasing her all around and trying to kill her. And, and she's running and he's after her and she's, uh, she's hiding and he's catching her and she gets away and all this stuff is going on. Okay, okay. I will go along that maybe at that moment on these two floors, there just doesn't happen to be anybody there. Okay. But then what happens is she's hiding in uh, uh, one of the refrigeration rooms where all the bodies are kept. And so he comes in the refrigeration room. Now, forget about the fact he's already killed a janitor who's lying down there in the basement dead. Electrified. Uh, Okay, so there's already a dead body involved. Okay, so he's lying in the basement. Now the assassin comes into the the cold storage body room where they're all being held up by their ears and a very creepy looking thing. Yeah, it made me wonder. Crichton knows what he's talking about. He mm -hmm. was a medical doctor at, was it John Hopkins? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Boston Memorial or Uh something like that. Well, this he, is Boston he, Memorial. <laughs> right. Well, he, well, yeah, I guess I, yeah. <laughs> he would know. <laughs> like, th- that's I don't what, know if they hold him up by the ear like a fish. <laughs> He's just caught. But okay. <laughs> it was that, weird. That'd be like bodies hanging by their lips. All right. You know, uh, so, so he's going through the dead bodies looking for her. They have a, a tussle. He's got a big gun with a silencer on it. He starts shooting at her. He hits a couple of the dead bodies. And then she gets out of the freezer and locks him in. Okay, so now you're in a public place. You're in an open hospital. A guy has just tried to kill you and has killed the janitor downstairs. And there's a dead body downstairs to prove it. Now you have the killer trapped. He cannot get out. He is in the cold storage. Not only that, He's in there with his gun. So he has the weapon. Not only that, there are now dead bodies that have those bullets in them because he has shot them. Does she go downstairs to the front desk and say, call the fucking cops? This guy tried to kill me and I have got him locked in the freezer door. No, she goes home to tell Michael Douglas all about the whole thing. She's in shock. It's absolutely absurd. Well, first of all, I think that the, that room, that cold storage you, room, no, no. If had either, two either, doors. Either the, I think it had two doors. She comes in one and goes out the other. You are just yanking that out of your ass. That, is not, <laughs> that has not been shown. And it's not even like the guy can say, what the fuck is she talking about? The gun is in the room. There are bullets in the bodies. And there's a dead guy downstairs. And she's a fucking doctor saying he did it. Well, one of the reasons <laughs> one of the reasons you don't think all those thoughts is because in the very following scene, the one you're talking about with Michael Douglas, where she's talking to him, 
Jean-Pierre Peugeot gives this amazing performance uh, where she's hysterical and crying and like it's it's real and it's she's giving her Rosemary's Baby uh, yeah. performance in that yeah. moment. She is, and it's so good and convincing that you're like, yeah, you're like she went to her, she went to the person she could trust. Thinks that is trust. such sloppy screenwriting. I just. I- <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I can, so, I can, I can agree with you on that. I think I can, I think I can agree with you a little bit. But uh, I just, I'm, I, I'm not thinking about that. Is the thing. I'm, well, I was thinking about it I when I watched. Looking, it. I, was, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know if I was thinking about it in 1978 when I saw the film. But I was. But when we watch it together, you. Yeah. Uh, oh, of course, I was thinking about it. It's not even that great of a sequence because it's, it's, it's a generic. Killer chasing the heroine, or the yeah. you know, not to be a woman, but the, the the hero of the of the thriller. All right, is is you know, it's just meant thrown in there to be some action. Now, I could be a dick and just piss on the whole concept of the way the conspiracy works in general about the fact that a bunch of doctors would all just get together and just throw the Hippocratic oath away and come up with this ridiculously preposterous and very chancy situation of murdering people, putting them in comas simply to sell their organs. Uh, and, and, and they're doing it all simply for money. It's only about money. There is a moment in the movie that's the classic moment in a thriller where our hero goes and, 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 and tells the person that they trust what's going on. And the person goes, I've seen this. We, we've all seen this scene a zillion times. And there was, wow, what a story. Hey, can I get you a drink? Yeah, sure. Here. <laughs> wow, have a drink. Okay, yeah. Wow, that's a really, really amazing tale. Thank you for, for coming to me with this. You've, you've uncovered a lot. Well, thank you. Oh, oh wait something, a minute. Something's Whoa, weird about something's this going drink. on. What's, <laughs> what's weird? I'm getting kind of dizzy. You know, you've been a real problem. <laughs> You've been a real problem. I tried to talk you out of it, but I'm going to now have to deal with you. Yeah, no, that's the poison that I put in yeah, your drink. That is the most arch moment of okay. the movie. And then at that point, normally in a movie, the person proceeds to give their little speech of the philosophy of why they're doing what they do. And usually in these kind of thrillers, you don't buy their philosophy, but at least they have a philosophy. They they buy it. They believe it. I'm expecting that to happen. He even, the, the, yeah, character, it, the it, character even starts, yes, it's easy when you're younger, but when you're older, us doctors, we have to make decisions between life and death and da-da-da-da-da. And then and he ends up saying nothing. Well, his argument is actually preposterous because yeah. all he has to do is say it's it's about money. That's all he has to say. And instead, he does this whole thing of we doctors, we have to take care, we have to make decisions for mm. people and make the hard choices. Yeah. It's just double talk. This is better for it. And it becomes such a, um, an arch villain. No, no, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it is really a situation because you figure that there was some philosophy behind it. And they go, what? So this is just about money? This is just about selling the gallbladder? This is just well, about- Well, that, that I could buy. This is just, it's just about the kid. I mean, I could even make a case for where he's coming from, where it's like, well, you know, um, yes, we yes we do sacrifice some of these healthy people. And yes, that is a sacrifice and that is a tragedy. However, if we harvest their organs, that one person could end up saving seven people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, I don't buy that argument, but that's an argument to be made for a megalomaniac. Well, uh, uh, but this was the discussion. Conspiracy when, killing doctor. But this was the discussion in the 70s when the book came out. Was mm-hmm. It was all about organ donations and uh, mm-hmm. um, organ transplants, which were starting to become a big thing. And there was so much distrust mm-hmm. among people about donating their organs. Mm-hmm. Should I be killed in an accident or whatever? Well, here's the thing. I will buy it for what it is. I will buy it for what it cells. Okay. I, you know, I, in the case of King Kong, I believe that there is an ape that could be that big. So uh, <laughs> whether it's, that's possible or not, but I'll go with it for now. Okay. Yeah. I will go, when I watch Land of the Giants, I believe that there could be a planet with people that big. All right. So I will go with that in the case of Cohen. jean of Bougeau is just fantastic in this movie. It's, she, it, it's, she holds it's, it together. You want to follow her. You just want to follow her everywhere she goes. It's one of the best 
lead in a thriller, you know, uncovering stuff, playing the Nancy Drew, whether it's a male mm-hmm. character or a female character. Uh, it's one of the better characters in a, in a thriller. And you really, really, really like her, yet she does not kill herself trying to be likable. Mm-hmm. And they do a very interesting thing between her and Michael Douglas that works both as their relationship and it also works in the thriller camp. Because we know... We know some of these people that we've met in the hospital, whether it be Richard Widmark or Rip Torn or somebody, some of them, one of them, all of them, who knows, are going to be part of this conspiracy. Yeah. And uh, and you're, is it this person? Is that this person? It feels like everybody. Yeah, it feels like everybody. Because you're paranoid like her yeah. by the, in the it, movie. Exactly. And I think one of the best screenwriting things that Michael Crichton does is the is he or isn't he aspect of Michael Douglas' character. Is he involved in this conspiracy or is he not? Is he innocent? Is he completely and utterly guilty? Is he just unconvinced by what she's saying or is he purposely, you know, trying to derail her because she's she's learning too much? You always believe that he, he cares for her. That's not the issue. But like, oh my God, maybe she's getting too close. And that is he a bad guy? Is he not a bad guy? propels you through the whole movie. There is so much um, attention placed on the male gaze. She, uh, There's this whole discussion of who's going to take the shower first. I'm going to take the shower first this time. Yeah. Like, I, like, And he's like, no, I'm going to take it. And, and it becomes sort of a, a pecking order thing among them. Yeah. Well, she's just like, screw that. I'm taking my shower. She gets in. We're in an extreme close-up of Michael Douglas in profile looking at her in the shower. Mm. He's talking. Mm-hmm. Okay, normally the convention would be to rack focus to his face. Mm-hmm. Crichton doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. Or I should say Victor Kemper doesn't do it. And it's a very, very conscious decision because mm-hmm. we as the audience are mm-hmm. then placed into the position of mm-hmm. looking at the female form. Yeah. You know, as they're Behind talking. the shower door, yeah. Behind the shower door. I love that shot. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love the shot. And I love what, what that shot does mm-hmm. in setting up their characters. But what I'm saying, though, is the fact that Throughout the whole movie, it hops on one foot, on the on the left foot, and the right foot. About is he a bad guy? Is he not? Is he a bad mm-hmm. guy? Is he not? And also, is Michael Douglas the male chauvinist that all the other people are in the film, or is he not? All right, this thing suggests maybe he is. This answer back from him suggests maybe he's not. So, mm-hmm. it, it, so it all you know, how much does he love her? How much is he committed to her? There's there's the left foot, there's the right foot. It all keeps going back and forth until, and in, and in the case of Michael Douglas, everything is eventually revealed. You actually get the answer to all three of those questions. Yeah. How much does he love her? How much is he involved? Is he a bad guy? And does he respect her? Yeah. All that is, is is all answered. It's all answered by the end of the film. Because those That's are the, fantastic. Because those are the things that I think Crichton cares about when he's adapting the book and making mm-hmm. the movie. Less so the mundane mechanics of now, the plot. When you talk about coma, well, there's the whole image of the bodies hanging, which is once you've seen it, you, you'll never, yeah, you, you can never unsee. It. The poster uh, tagline was: "Imagine your life hangs by a thread. <laughs> Imagine your body hangs by a wire. Imagine that you're not imagining." Mm-hmm. Coma. Yeah. And then and there's that wonderful, wonderful moment with Elizabeth Ashley, who's the, the nurse at the coma facility, and the one body is just kind of out of place. She's great and, in this. Yeah. She's terrific at it. And she, the one body's out of place, and she just kind of touches it and just like, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's going to be okay. It's Every, gonna be everything's okay. going to be okay. Like, and Calm down. <laughs> what, I liked, what I liked about that is it showed that like this may be this nefarious institution, uh-huh. but there is kind of a soul going on in there. She cares, yeah. that woman. She cares about those people. Having seen the movie at the theaters when it came out, the reason Coma was a hit, aside from the, uh, the the interesting premise, is because the climax at the end is so damn exciting. It is so much fun. That is why it was a hit. Yeah. That is why people applauded in the movie theater at the very end. You got your money's worth for the end in a packed movie theater, and people walked out laughing, and they enjoyed it, and they told their friends, and then they went and saw it. It's because of the ending that it was a hit, and it deservedly a hit. And I remember sitting in Delamo, when a certain reveal happens, and I won't say what it is, mm-hmm. but when a certain reveal happens, the audience just burst into applause. Yeah. I mean, just 
burst into applause. You know, it, it was one of the wonderful moments like that in, in, uh, in going to movies in the 70s it was with a jam-packed audience and they just all, you know. Everybody got, wanted that moment to happen. And it happened, yeah. all right? And it and there was just a magnificent reaction yeah. and you really made you feel like why it's fun to go to the movies. Yeah, that's the power of a movie theater. And you know, walked out of the UA Delamo back into the mall, just yeah. feeling great, right? having a wonderful time at the films. There's so many discussions. Everything is about kidneys in the movie. She's mm-hmm. talking to that child mm-hmm. about, you know, his kidney. And, and we see that she kind of knows he's not going to get the yeah. kidney he needs. Yeah. And so she gives him two pieces of candy. She's like, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you may as well yeah. live life now. Well, there's an, and there's, there's, there's so many kidney discussions, right? Like it's the kidneys that they're selling. Yeah. Okay, mostly, now, right? There's a weird aspect in coma though. Okay, how random are these people that they decide to put in comas? Oh, I have a, I have a thought on that uh-huh. because Tom Selleck's character, you didn't mention it. He is the picture of health, Yeah, but he's also kind of gay in the movie. Like he's got the mustache. He's like me and my buddies, you know, we were, horsing around like he's actually playing he's an athlete (laughs) i know but watch it again he's playing a gay guy and there's even that whole thing of when he's saying that he had like that they were playing touch football Mm -hmm. but he's kind of like me and me and the boys were just (laughs) and then and then lois childs's character is getting an abortion so i feel like at some level well okay well that's they're they're making these kind of executive decisions based on who they feel are moral choices. I, I I don't buy your Tom Selleck story. All right, but uh, uh, but the Lois Child one, her situation is talked about to such a degree where we don't need to know anything. One, she didn't need to go into an, for an abortion. She could have gone in for anything, but she's going in for an abortion. It's very specific. We're told she got pregnant from having an affair out of wedlock with her husband, and then the doctor even discusses it during her yeah. operation. Okay, it looks like this little this little minx is going to get away with it. Not, not, my, not my place to make a moral decision. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, all this stuff, it does suggest that maybe because uh, uh, she's getting an abortion, she's the one that's put on the list. Okay, so that's all I really have to say about- Well, actually, uh, I have one more thing I want to bring up, and that's uh-huh. Ed Harris. Oh, yeah. In this movie, when she goes down into the- um, It's uh, a very funny sequence. The autopsy space yeah. where all of the, the, the pathology room- Yeah. And all the pathology guys are down there. What I love about that scene is in this world of abject chauvinism that is everywhere, she goes down into the place where all they think about all day long is how to murder people (laughs) and murdering people. And those are the one guys that are, A, not chauvinist at all. They give her everything she needs. They talk to her. as They don't try to get a date. They don't don't try to get a date. They don't try to get a phone number. (laughs) No, no. They're like the geeks who are just totally like, they're they're the only people you can trust. Yeah. They're they're not being, they're, they're, they're not trying to be flirty. They actually literally are engaging yeah. with her. And Ed Harris gives such a great, funny performance yeah. in like And, and so does the like other guy. They're, they're, they're a good team. Oh, they're a great team. Yeah. And they they actually predate those two computer nerds in uh, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, completely. Yeah. <laughs> that Dean, but- Dean Butler plays one of them. They yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, to such a degree that I actually think that maybe that sequence is based on this Oh, sequence. for sure. And <laughs> the sequence, the autopsy sequence in Wolfen yeah, yeah, yeah. is similar to that. Like, it is. It, 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 the, the, any anyone who eats in a uh, yeah. in pathology <laughs> is, is probably come from coma. <laughs> there is another thing to mention. Victor Kemper, who was the DP of this, is also the DP of Mikey and Nikki. Oh, that's true. Yes. So today's theme: Victor Kemper, Victor Kemper. DP, <laughs> Victor J. Kemper, yeah. who also uh, mostly a studio guy, but also did Eyes of Laura Mars, yeah. Magic, Xanadu. His work in both of them is fantastic, and they could not be more opposite. <laughs> Yeah. Frankly, I am not a fan of movies that are set in hospitals. I find them boring and dull drab to look at. Dull to look and at, yeah. dull and everything's lit by fucking oh, you, fluorescence. All right. You but, shot an entire uh, episode yeah. in a hospital. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, well, the, the, that was interesting, though, because in the case of ER, ER they, yeah. they went out, they went a long way to not making it drab. They have like light flares and all yeah. these like really interesting, you know, they, they, they came up with a, with a, a, a dynamic design for the hospital. Well, coma has the same design. There's nothing drab about coma, even when they're in the normal hospital. Yeah. And when they get to the coma Institute, yeah, you know, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it, she's like walked into a, a, a German expressionistic painting. Have you ever wondered what the lead singer of Smash Mouth, Zach Goody, feels about new versus old guys in music and cinema? 
or how photographer Toasty Cakes makes his cinematic discoveries? What about the opinion of Rotten Tomatoes editor Jacqueline Coley and what she considers to be the new Hollywood shift of the streaming era? Join me, reporter on the beat Gala Avery, as I get to the bottom of these very questions. Starting on October 26th, I have a new guest on the mic every week. Yes, every Thursday here, your favorite filmmakers, photographers, actors, models, and more talk about a topic that is near and dear to their heart that they want you to know about. You'd be surprised at what people are interested in. The Gala Show premieres October 26th with new episodes every Thursday, available wherever you get your podcasts. So, Gala! Hello. I watched Coma, and I liked it so much that in the same week, I bought the Blu-ray and watched Coma again. (laughs) I actually think this is now one of my favorite movies of all time. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go out and say it. I love Coma. Uh, All of the hospital scenes feel super authentic. When she goes and sees the therapist, he's using actual motivational interviewing techniques. I'm Mm -hmm. a psychology student uh, at Harvard. And... He's using the techniques properly, which you never see in movies them actually using psychology techniques properly. Yeah. And then later, Dr. George is using them on her also just yeah, yeah. to manipulate her. I really like that. I, I like the the, the uh, therapist. Which goes, and nobody cares. Really? Nobody, nobody cares. Yeah, you, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. I love only that you. Guy. Only you. Yeah, I love that guy. <laughs> That's Harry Rhodes, actually. He's a cool, uh, is, a, is a cool, I used to star about De- uh, Detroit 9000. Oh, yeah, because all of these, like, <laughs> actors that, like, just pop up everywhere are mm. all really good Yeah, they're actors. terrific. I think yeah. that, like, every performance is a great performance. Mm. This is an example of a strong, like, headstrong woman who is really likable. I have to just go out and say, I love her. I found her mm. actually lovable. Maybe it's because she's fighting against sexism or Mm -hmm. against chauvinism or whatever it is. But even when she's wrong, I like that she just goes for it. Yeah. She's just doing it. And I love that it's like invasion of the body snatchers level of paranoia. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's her grief or if it is a bigger conspiracy for a while in the movie. And then eventually. Grief of her friend, Lois Childs. Grief of losing Lois Childs, who I love Mm -hmm. Lois Childs. I think that's pretty apparent. Watching the movie this time. I was thinking, what if they actually went m- more the Polanski way with Rosemary's Baby, where you know she could be wrong, she yeah. could just be suffering from postpartum depression, and uh, uh, and then everything ultimately is just circumstantial evidence <laughs> until the very end. Everything's you know, it's uh, just paranoia. Ralph Ralph, Ralph Bellamy could be a hundred percent right, yeah, in his uh, diagnosis of her in the film, um, and. Uh, I don't think it quite goes that far. I wonder. I started wondering if it did go that far. If I if I would like it more, and I'm not sure. But it's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, and I kind of wish it had gone that far. I kind of wish a little bit, just a little bit. I just wish it had gone just a little further. bit more. But I will say, and now Quentin, you asked Roger, are you going to go toe to toe with me on this? And he didn't go. I'm going to. That cadaver part is one of my favorite parts of the movie. I find that chase sequence so fun. It re-energizes the movie. Mm-hmm. They are in the school part of the hospital, which is why it's empty. Right, that's why there's an They're auditorium. They're in the auditorium and the uh, the bodies that have been donated to science so that they can work on them and learn, which yeah. is why it's empty. Can, yeah. The number one thing, though, that I think you left out when you're discussing, like, why doesn't she immediately go downstairs? She's pushed all the bodies on him. She just killed him. She's going kill to have She killed him. He's dead. <laughs> Imagine getting all of those bodies she on She did you. not kill him. He's dead. She did uh, not kill him. She, she just knocked him I down. I think he's dead. I mean, if you had like twenty or thirty dead bodies placed on you, it's not twenty you, or thirty. It's like nine. I, I'm gonna go. It's I'm like gonna seven up, or nine. I'm gonna pull out my Blu-ray disc of coma. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna count I, the bodies. I, I count about seven or nine. It would you not, have seven or nine. But yeah, but would, still, those are those are bodies a are heavy. Car would kill him. B- 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 bodies are heavy. They're not. <laughs> not not to crush him to death. No, it wouldn't do that. Well, the only it thing definitely I could, incapacitates him. Well, I just I For personally I understand her being so afraid that she goes to the one person she thinks she can trust, which is her boyfriend. I would hope that if you're dating someone, you could trust them. If there's a maniac killer, but if you're after the, but you. if but if you are at the hospital, you gotta point. trust town. Yeah, <laughs> there is. Cops, right there. There is security that is paid for. Now everyone thinks you're crazy. Now you can tell them all. Okay, I think the chase scene is perfunctionary, but it's just what she does afterwards that's 
absolutely absurd. <laughs> okay, we can agree to disagree because I honestly don't care because it's just so fun. And I love the reveal of the whistle for Michael Douglas. I don't know why whenever he's in a movie, when he's making tea, they use this whistle. <laughs> like it always... It's always it's happening. His, it's his signature it's touch. It's his signature touch. If he makes tea, the whistle has to go off and something crazy has to happen. It's my trademark. <laughs> <laughs> now, the kidney. Because this movie is all about the kidney. That's the thing. Is oh, that At one well, point, he says, we have to make the hard decisions. They're doing it for the children. Oh, for They're children. They're harvesting these oh, organs a, I hadn't for thought the of children. That. I actually hadn't thought because of that. He, no, that's, Doesn't he? I, he I, does I, not say it. No, but Quentin. He does not but, say but, it. Quentin, You're saying that. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. She is. she is saying that, but. But what she's saying actually supports, in some ways, his wonky argument of we have to make the choices. Okay, he's got to make it, mate. Okay, you guys can't make it for him. <laughs> I thought he, at he a certain point. He even has the scene to explain it all. He has to make the argument. You can't make the argument well, for him. Well, he made it to Gala. I, made, I, made, <laughs> I just made the argument, but that doesn't count. Okay. I don't know. It was made well enough to me that I was under the impression that he's doing it for the children. And it, Quentin, I have to say it is a t- an attack on femininity. A hundred percent. The people they are targeting for these comas. You have Lois Childs with an abortion. You have Jane Doe, who has a lump on her breast. Mm-hmm. You have Tom Selleck, who is <laughs> wrestling with the guys. <laughs> Whether it's football. Are you buying your <laughs> no, no, no. We had We watched it separately and we had the same conclusion. So maybe it's just because we're in the same household and because I am of him. Yeah. But <laughs> the, what the whole movie is about is that she's being attacked as a woman and there's an attack on femininity going on. They're choosing people. Well, I didn't that, argue about that. Yeah, yeah but, I'm, but I think that mm-hmm. they're specifically choosing people that are having issues with their femininity. I brought that up. I agree yeah. with you. Okay. I, 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 I'm betting that in the book, it probably, Richard Widmark's philosophy is probably laid out. In a, in, in, in a, a much in, more clear way. In a, in, in, a, in a stronger way. But I am not letting Crichton off the hook because it's not like, oh, he didn't have time to deal with that. He gives Richard Widmark a speech that he just says homilies and he just says cliches. Yeah. And he doesn't get, you know, and I, I respect what you're saying, but you're saying it. He's not saying it. You're drawing it from him. Well, I think because the whole question of why have the scene where she's talking to the child. And part of it is to illustrate the need for kidneys. For these okay, desperate this, situations. This is great storytelling that you guys are doing that it's all <laughs> fucking smoke and mirrors and we have to <laughs> pour lemon juice on the fucking pages so you can read the invisible ink. All right. <laughs> Do we have to make a Moonraker connection here with <laughs> Secret Agents and Lois Childs? Okay, I'm in. <laughs> I, I also, one thing I will say though is in that final arch speech, I really like the effect they used. I never liked that. I, oh, you I mean I the, never, the, the kind of I actually, wow, yeah, wow, 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 the, the, no, the, but, the but problem I, is in that moment, we kind of need a little clarity. We need the explanation get delivered to us. And it, suddenly it becomes all about weird lenses. And I, yeah, and, and I, uh, I would, I, and slow motion. Always in a situation, like not always in a situation, you never say always. And I don't mean always, but normally, at least in this situation, I don't want to see the world through jean of Bougeot's eyes getting all weird with crazy lenses, all right, that don't hold up to today. Uh, I want to see her, the effect of the drug on her as she's like crumbling to the floor with the villain standing over her. And I want to hear clearly yeah. what he has to say. I, I frankly <laughs> couldn't believe it that she actually went to him. Mm-hmm. I, I just have an inherent distrust of, mm-hmm. you know, you know me, I mm-hmm. have an inherent distrust of corporations, Governments, mobs of people, you know, doctors well, frankly, fall into that. Well, and so well, I. Well, frankly, there is, you know. Bureaucrats. Case, bureaucrats is what I. Not doctors. A bureaucrats. case could be made that the film is actually is. Uh, uh, it's double investing in its patriarchal dynamic. Yes. Because, you know, he's setting himself up as, you know, he's the great father of this situation and, you know, and she's, she's the bright, shiny penny that's coming in there. And so, you know, when she does come to him, she's coming to the great father to write everything and to fix everything, you know? So, so even she at the end of the day, when it comes to age and wisdom and position, even she ultimately, this is the, this is the society she lives in and she goes to the great father. 
I also just have to say, I didn't really, I wasn't really fooled by the whole Dr. George thing. That was the one thing that was kind of confusing to me that they're trying to say, oh, it's the anesthesiologist. We're talking about, yeah, talking about uh, 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 George and uh, George. Rip, 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 Rip Torn. Now, yeah, they're trying to say it's Rip Torn. Dr. But, George. And well, what, what? George Rip, so-and-so. Well, Rip Torn, well, I don't know. I didn't buy the George I, yeah, double thing at all. I was all. so confused when she's like realizing when she's drugged. And I, I, was I like, wasn't what? even following George until that moment. Yeah, I know. Me, me neither. Now, the thing about Rip Torn, though, okay, he's just a complete red herring. There's no no doubt about that. I actually think he maybe gives the best characterization <laughs> along with jean bierre Bourgeau in the film. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's it good. doesn't even matter that he's a red herring. He is fantastic. I, I wish he had more scenes. He's really, really good every time he comes in. Yeah, him and his three really sexy Asian nurses that <laughs> yeah. are just all, hello, Dr. George. I'm sure that that was a very specific Crichton detail mm-hmm. that he knew was real. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that brings us to the end of our comic I, would I will watch tell you, Quentin, that my beautiful box that you have in your hands, mm-hmm. because you love it so much, I bought that for $7.49. It is a MGM UA big box release, and it's originally owned by Video Connections at... 6400 Northeast Highway 99 in Vancouver, Washington. Oh, wow. That's really cool. And you, your box is all together. And, th- and what that means is that it opens up like a book <laughs> as opposed to like a thing that's inserted. Yeah. And it has that wonderful MGM thing where it has the entire cast beautifully and, and their characters all written down this side in just the lovely, lovely way. One hour and 44 minutes. Yeah. So, so if anyone was, call out to Video Connections, right? Yeah. If anyone actually rented Coma from Video Connections... Let me know. Yeah, drop us a line. <laughs> uh, the Video Archives VHS was bought on 8-20-1987 for $59.95. Peter Falk is Mikey. I got a terrific suggestion for you, Nick. I suggest you find somebody you can trust. John Cassavetes is Nicky. They're going to kill me, Nick. They're going to kill me. On a night like this, there are no rules. <laughs> Mikey and Nicky. Written and directed by Elaine May. Ma, if anything happens to me, Mikey did it. And we're back. And the next film on our double feature that we've already mentioned once before, and Roger pointed out, the same cinematographer, is writer-director Elaine May's film Mikey and Nikki, starring Peter Falk and John Cassavetes. This movie has kind of interesting history. Before I go into the history, though, let me read the back of the box, which... Actually, is very well written, frankly, to tell you the truth, but it maybe says too much. It definitely says too much as far as the narrative surprises that I like in the film. So, like I said, if you intend to see Mikey and Nikki, I would skip listening to this episode until after you've seen it. Um, if you don't care, here we go. Nikki, a small time hood, is in big trouble. He's stolen syndicate money, and the local czars put a contract out on him. Over beers at the B&O bar, Nikki pleads with a lifelong friend for help. Will he make airline arrangements for him and help him escape? Obliging, Mikey walks to the phone, drops in a dime, and dials the hitman. Peter Falk and John Cassavetes give stunning performances in writer-director Elaine May's Mikey and Nikki. Cassavetes is Nikki, a hot-wired charmer, capable of fast-talking his way through any situation, except perhaps this one. Falk is Mikey, a weak-willed workaday racketeer who's silently embittered by Nikki's long-time abuse of their long-term friendship. Short, simple, and if not sweet, at least efficient, that's how Mikey hoped the job would be done. But wide-eyed, suspicious Nikki won't stay in one place long enough to allow it. He careens from one neighborhood stomping ground to another, and Mikey's setup becomes a Blackley comic setup that leaves the bumbling hitman, Ned Betty, he's not bumbling, uh, uh, cruising the right block at the wrong time. He's just out of town. Yeah. The misuses send Mikey on a long night's journey of forced camaraderie with Nikki. And what a night. It's an emotional whirlwind of dames, dupes, and a painful pass, which before dawn reveals the battered foundation of their once solid friendship. Throughout the night, the hired assassin, like a shark circling for the kill, moves closer to his prey. As Nikki increasingly senses his entrapment, Mikey comes to realize his own. Does he hang on to the comfortable niche in his life the mob has given him, or does he rescue his low-life but lifelong friend? 
Re-released in 1984 to raves of critics everywhere, Mikey and Nikki has acquired a much-deserved second life. But you'll have to see for yourself if Nikki gets another chance. To say more would ruin a final sequence that Stanley Kaufman and Sally Review described as one of the most harrowing images that modern American film has ever given us. I have to say they described Ned Beatty's character as both bumbling and a shark circling to kill. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, so that's a, a Warner Brothers home video. It, uh, Mikey and Nikki, color, 107 minutes. So first let me tell a little bit, uh, uh, a bit of the history of Mikey and Nikki before we get into the movie proper. And uh, Roger, this is another film that you had never seen before. Yeah, I had always... I know you're a, like an Elaine May fan. I'm a big Elaine May a, fan. A big, big Elaine May, like a champion of Elaine May. I think May. she's one of the greatest screenwriters of all time. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I think her direction of movies, I'm a, I'm a big fan yeah. of that. And well. I had never had that same appreciation. However, I'm like a Cassavetes fan. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it was, but over the years, I just consistently stayed away from this, even though uh, th- th- it, it, it felt like imitation to me. Mm-hmm. Even though everything in it is stuff that I would love, like mm. Peter Falk, John Cassavetes, Gangster these, Story, Gangster Story, these two brothers out on the—they're mm. not brothers, but they might as well be brothers. like, yeah, underworld brothers. Yeah, these two guys, like, uh, and and their relationship together, uh, like everything about it is something I would love. I just there was just something I just repelled away mm-hmm. from it over the years. And then you you mentioned that we were going to watch it, and I, I, and I kind of, to be honest, I was like, well okay, bring it on. Mm-hmm. And she brought it on. Mm-hmm. I, and I was like, really like, especially taken by the film. I have, a, I have a few issues with the movie, yeah. like small issues though. Mm-hmm. I think this is a movie that you kind of divide in two halves. Mikey and Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Yeah. Li- literally. <laughs> the film starts, the character of Nikki uh, thinks that there's a uh, hit out on him. He's held up in a hotel room. He's done something. He's done- yeah, he worked for he worked for the the bookmaking bank, and yeah. he and and him and another guy who got whacked. Yeah. All right. Uh. Uh. uh, uh stole some money, so now they're yeah. after. Him. He he assumes that everyone's going to be after him. Yeah. And yeah, no, but he's actually heard that there that Resnick, who's the head mob yeah. guy played yeah. by uh, the acting teacher uh, Sanford Meisner, he's actually heard that there's a, actually a hit on him. So the whole almost part of the story of the movie almost is like. Will Nikki live through the night? He's got to live through the night. Okay, mm-hmm. if he can live through the night, they can maybe get him out of town. But can, will he live through the night? And we kind of live through that night with him to see what happens. So he calls his old friend, who's a, a, a gangster with him in this business. But you know, he's he's known him since he was a little boy. He's literally a lifelong friend. Yeah, they grew up on the street together. Yeah, and he call, and he calls his friend Mikey. He's the only one he can really trust because they go back so far. And Mikey shows up to. Uh, to help him, to calm him down, and to uh, take care of him, and you know, hopefully, maybe even get him out of town. Possibly, this is all set up in the first half of the movie. And the first half of the movie is you don't want Nikki to get killed. You want him to get out of this, and you want Mikey to help him. And then the movie has, I actually think, one of the more devastating narrative reveals. You can see in a film. In that bar? In the bar. Yeah. You know, obviously you're buying Falk and Cassavetti's friendship because they were best yeah, friends. We've and seen and, so many movies with them. And they're and they're just, like, you know, they're just this. they're literally maybe one of the best dramatic acting teams that there is. And you you, you want Mikey to help him and you, you think he's helping them. Then all of a sudden it cuts to the Ned Beatty character who's the hitman and he's on the phone and he's being, Nikki is being fingered. And you have no idea who's fingering him, but you figure, okay, well, this is the hitman. He's going to go get him and everything. And then it cuts to the bar that they're at and you see Peter Falk hang up the phone. Yeah. And frankly, if you blink, you might miss it. Yeah. When you realize that Mikey is setting him up and is fingering him for the hitman, it's unfathomable. You can't believe it. You can't even comprehend that he is actually betraying him to that degree and makes you fucking despise him and you want him to come to his senses. He's a fink. And he's, a, he's, a, he's a traitor. It's unconscionable. That's the first half of the movie. Yeah. The second half of the movie is when you realize what a true piece of shit 
Nikki, Nikki is, is yeah. and he deserves to die. And at the end of the movie, you kind of want him to die, and it's Peter Falk, it's Mikey who you feel sorry for. It is Mikey who rips your heart out at the end. And that is just a fucking brilliant, dramatic structure for a movie basically about two people that you you carry through for the beginning of the end, and it's a magnificent, magnificent pressure cooker for a, a, a crime story. Yeah. I mean, when they finally end up, I think it's in the graveyard, mm-hmm. Mikey turns to Nikki and he says, I don't think you love anybody but you. It's in this moment we realize how long uh, Mikey has been subjected to being uh, kind of- Ridiculed. Ridiculed by the mob, Take, by Resnick, by yeah. the, mm-hmm. by all of them. Taken lightly, taken for granted. Yeah. And then and the discovery that he's kind of been betrayed by his friend. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very deftly handled because it does allow you to in that, like in that moment, you're immediately, I, I was immediately on Peter Falk's side. Yeah. And I completely related to Peter Falk also because, mm-hmm. you know, at first you think, oh, he's the guy who didn't We're do watching well. this movie together and go, oh my God, am I Nikki? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, am I Mikey? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm anybody, I'm fucking Nikki. Yeah, this is yeah, not so good. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think I'm Mikey. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's good either. <laughs> but um, when he's like, look, I don't want you to be my friend when nobody else is around. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he's been like making jokes on his behalf. Well, okay, and, look, then he, and then he plays off it. He's like, oh, no, no. It's like I was, oh, we that, were joking look, together. That, look. It's that, fucking that, devastating. It's terrible. That, that's the best. No, that's, that's actually not in the graveyard. That's afterwards, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. In the it's afterwards. It's, it's out on the they, street. It's, it, a, it's after he left the, 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 the girl's house. It's in that incredible moment where Elaine May just lets him go and yeah, they yeah. start like wrestling like two little yeah. kids on the street. I <laughs> think that's a, in particularly Peter Fox confronting him about the, the joke that happened in the restaurant. It's painful. I think that is not just one of the best scenes of this movie, if not the best scene in this movie, it's. One of the best written and best acted scenes between two men in any film of the 70s, as far as I'm concerned. It is as good as any of the uh, Harvey Cattell, Robert De Niro sequences in in Mean Street it, uh, or, or in Taxi Driver. He goes, I walked into that restaurant and you're sitting there with Resnick. And I have to say your name three times because I'm too embarrassed to walk away without getting an answer. Yeah. And then you give me a little acknowledgement. And then just as I left, you turn to Resnick and you say, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I forgot to order the clams from that guy. <laughs> yeah. And you laugh. No. no, I did that joke for you. I said that for you. Yeah, I said that for you. I said, I, I no, that, no, that's why I said it loud enough that you would hear that joke was for you. That joke was not for Resnick. That joke was for you. And you know what? In his mind, in his mind, he might be justifying it that way. But mm-hmm. the truth of the matter is like, Nikki does not have a lot of honor. Like he has this moment with the bus driver mm-hmm. where they actually work. They, they're having a little fracas and they're yeah. fighting with uh-huh. the, this bus driver, M. Emmett Walsh. Yeah, yeah. And it, like, they're all like in a headlock or yeah, something. Like uh-huh. he's holding him. He's like, ah! And, like, I, I, can't, got, I can't fight on the bus. I'll get fired. Well, then we'll get off. Oh, no, 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 yeah, you'll get off the back door. No, no, we'll get off the front. No, you'll get off the back door. Okay, if we get off the back door, okay, I'll give you my word. If I let you go, you won't do anything. And then we're going to get off the back door. Okay, okay. Like, yeah, I believe him. I'll he's let, a man of his word. I'll let you go. Don't hit me, but then we'll go outside. And then we're going to really have at it. And then <laughs> they go out the front door. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he runs away. He, yeah. he didn't have to do that. Yeah. He does it on purpose mm-hmm. because he can. Mike and Nikki was made, I think they started making it around 74 or so. And uh, sh- she was shooting it for Paramount. She ended up shooting an incredible amount of footage. And for whatever reason that I have no fucking clue, uh, she was in the editing room for like a year. Mm-hmm. No, I don't understand why, but she was. And so by the time they were done with it in 1976, Paramount didn't know what to fucking do with this. And they really weren't into it. And they just threw it out there. They threw it out there. I remember when it opened in 76, um, they had an interesting little ad in the paper. Uh, I think it played in one theater in uh, Westwood, you know, or, or like the Fine Arts, L- Lemley Fine Arts or something like that. Just one theater in Los Angeles. And... None of the critics knew what to make of it. And I do think the Peter Falk, John Cassavetes thing derailed them a little bit. To be honest, that was the barrier for entry to me is I was just afraid it was going to be aping Mm -hmm. the whole 
Peter Falk, Cassavetes, uh, kind of improv Meisner thing, yeah. and that it was just going to be a big ape of that. Yeah. And I found out, okay, it, it, it is actually way more structured than that. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like that at all. It's, it, not, it's it, actually not that. It's I, its own thing. When you compare Mikey and Nikki to, say, John Cassavetes' genre piece, which is uh, – a, a killing of a Chinese bookie. Yeah. Okay, no, that's a John Cassavetes For movie sure. dipping its toe into genre while not really giving a fuck about genre, but just doing its own thing, using it as a simply as a framework. Mm-hmm. And it works or doesn't work depending on how you feel about uh, about that. And sometimes- Mikey and Nikki completely and utterly works as a magnificent crime story. Her movie is shot. His movies aren't shot. His movies are captured. Yeah, absolutely. Frequently by hidden cameras. Yeah, and he never he he's never had strong cinematographers because he's not about that. John Cassavetes doesn't gonna, care. John Cassavetes not going to spend three hours lighting a night street. He's going to spend five minutes focusing. It's just not what he. It's just not what he cares about. It's just, he's about conjuring up moments and and capturing something that a normal movie wouldn't capture. Yeah, and then running up afterwards with release forms to get the uh, street people <laughs> yeah. that just happen to be in the movie. But Mikey and yeah, but Mikey and Nikki is is well shot and it's uh and it, it's it's shot it's directed and and so then basically uh uh you know the film just disappeared um uh, uh paramount didn't give a damn about it but in 84 a small release company castle hill uh productions they also released um uh the henry jaglin movie uh, uh can she bake a cherry pie mm-hmm. somehow they got the rights to mikey and nikki and in 1984 they, it got re-released again. And this was at, in the time in Los Angeles where uh, the Beverly Center Entertainment Complex yeah. was like the big art house place. And so it just got like booked in a theater there. And then in 84, that's when it got the reviews that it never got. You know, the, that's when the Stanley Kaufman piece comes out. That's when the Michael Ventura rave review and the LA Weekly comes out. And that's when people, you know, started appreciating it for what it is. So that's its history. I'm wondering, huh, Elaine Bay is a writer, one of the best screenwriters in the history of Hollywood. And she's a writer who does not put her name on her own projects that much. She would much rather, not much rather, but she oftentimes for a lot of money would come in and do huge rewrites that she she didn't take credit on. Those, uh, pay Those can pay well. Yeah, they can pay well, and she did some some of uh, you know her most standout work that mm-hmm. way. She was very protective about what she eventually put her name on. So, coming from a point of view of a writer, and coming from where she's coming from, from more of a comedy place, what the fuck made her sit down to write this story about these two fucking dudes? What is the epitome of that? I don't think it's just to make a crime film. I don't think she's that kind of genre person that wants to do that. So what is it? What is it that made her make this story about these two guys? I was fascinated by that. So fascinated that I, um, I got in touch with Elaine May. And I called her up and um, I asked her. I asked her, what was it about these guys that you wanted to tell the story about. I was thinking maybe that it was actually a Hollywood story, that these were people she knew in Hollywood. It's about Roger and Quentin. (laughs) 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 That she knew in Hollywood that she wanted to explore and she wanted to explore that dynamic, but then she simply made them gangsters and made it a crime movie in order to make it a, you know, a movie. Even using an example in my head, I'm not saying that this would be these people or I'm making any aspersions on these people, but like Nikki could be Jack Nicholson sitting in a restaurant Mm -hmm. and he's sitting there with the the mob character Resnick, who could be Mike Metavoy. Because Nicholson's the cool guy. Yeah. and and Everybody wants to hang out with him. And Mikey is Monty Hellman, you know, uh, uh, who comes in there and approaches him and uh, you has to say Jack's name three times. And they, hey, Monty, how you doing? You know, and he walks away and he makes some little joke at Monty's expense. And Monty hears it. Um, I'm not saying Jack would do that or anything like that, but but it's just- That's the kind, it's it's a- Famous dynamic. It's a it's a famous dynamic, and and you know we can all come up with you know twenty other little examples of of of, of people's relationships sure, in could, Hollywood. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it's the Fight Club dynamic, where yeah. you've got the mm-hmm. extrovert and the something of an introvert, yeah. and they're dynamic with each other. So anyway, I was thinking maybe that that might be what it was, and she just simply uh, um, 
you know, came up with a, a gangster genre, like I said, to make it a movie. So I called her up and asked her about it. And she didn't understand what the fuck I was talking about at all when I brought that yeah, up. Yeah, when you told me your theory, I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. that actually makes a lot of sense. Like it's a- <laughs> So I brought it up to her. Observational And metaphor. she's like, wait, I don't, what, what is Hollywood about my story? <laughs> I go, oh, no, I'm not saying your story is Hollywood. I, and so I, then I laid it out the way, just exactly the way I laid it out to you. And she, and she was like, oh, I see where you're going with that. You know, that makes sense. That's not where I was coming from, though. Okay, so where were you coming from? I knew two brothers exactly like this when I was a child in, uh, uh, in Chicago. I go, you did? She goes, yes. When I was a little girl. Uh, we lived in an apartment building and there were uh, different people in the area, both Italians and Greeks and Jews. They were all involved with the mob and especially with bookmaking mm-hmm. and bookmaking banks. And there were these two brothers that were pretty much the emblem of, of Mikey and Nikki in my mind. Both gangsters, but one brother was kind of beloved by everybody. Everybody liked them. They liked being with him. They thought he was funny. He was handsome. And everyone dug him. And then then the big bosses really, really liked him. And then he stole money from them. And then they wanted to kill him. And part of the reason they wanted to kill him is because they liked him so much. They like, how dare you? When, when they, when the mob likes you that much and then you fuck them, that's when they really, really want to teach you a lesson. And it was to such a degree that the mother of the two sons even had a favorite son. And the favorite son was the Nikki character, the one in trouble. And the mob had gotten in touch with her and told her, you have to send one of your sons to this one place because that's where we're going to take care of him. And she knew she had no choice. So she did a Sophie's choice. Yeah. And she sent the other son. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> that's wild. And then she's, you know, Actually, that's such a good dynamic. I can't it, believe she didn't put that in the. Yeah, I, the I, movie, right? I, I think that's probably how, how, where she started, yeah. and then this it's developed into yeah. developed into this. But you know, and then she just made a very in, in, interesting. All the emotional dynamics are actually the same, though. Whether yeah. it's two brothers in, well, uh, I mean, they, these guys she, might as well be brothers. Yeah, all right, yeah. you know, um, well, especially Cassavetes and uh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Peter Falk. Well, no, the, it, well, in real life, yeah. yes, but even in the movie, as Mikey and Nikki, they might as, especially the way they always they talk about each other's parents all the time, and and uh, I, one of my favorite moments in that is the whole discussion of uh, uh, Mikey's brother Izzy. All right, the diet of cancer. That yeah. whole that that's actually that, that, that's a beautiful section. That's just yeah. a really really beautiful section. Um, this was really fascinating one to know that this all came from two people that Elaine May knew. And like when she knew when she was a little girl, this is something that happened, I think. In the neighborhood. I'm guessing she was nine or 10 or 11. I mean, like around that age, that was the age, kind of age and where she, she was talking and about. And I just don't know, where did she grow up? Chicago. Brooklyn, Chicago. So Chicago. Chicago. Oh, yeah, of course. So this uh, is very Chicago. Yeah, so yeah, she she, she kept of. making a point that this is very Chicago. This is yeah. the Chicago thing. And she even told me that the first time she attempted to write this, it was as a one act play before she had even joined Second City. Hmm. That's how early this was in her mind, that she wrote it as a one-act play before her Second City years, which is the beginning of Elaine yeah, May. That's, yeah. And so then after all that time, to now come back to that original story, that original one-act play, and then sit down and that's going to be your new movie, that's pretty darn fascinating. That's the, you know, I was glad to find, I liked my little theory. All right. Uh, and I think it still works. All right. But, uh. Totally. Work. I kind of wish she had just rolled with it. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, no, no. I, that's I, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I, well, my, you know, my little subtextual theory still works if you want to buy it. All right. Yeah. Uh, um, well, there, there's also something kind of a dynamic that she sets up that isn't brothers and isn't a mother turning her child in, which mm-hmm. is, uh, I think, super interesting and we are not like this (laughs) together, but um, you know, Mikey is like a family guy. Mm -hmm. Like I, when I, when I was first watching the movie, he is a family guy. I was thinking, Oh, he's uh, like, he's the one who really didn't ascend. Mm -hmm. No, he's living really well. Yeah. Yeah. He's living in a nice house. He's got a wife. He's living a very suburban existence. In fact, he has a little child reminded me of 
your child. <laughs> like, I looked at him and I was like, Jesus, it no, looks like Quentin's kid. No, <laughs> his little boy, he's five years old. I, I was thinking about Leo the whole time watching the movie. All right. thought, he, he Even the way and, he talked about him. Yeah, too. it's like, yeah. oh, hey, uh, bring me a crayon, honey. Like, yeah, I have yeah, to take uh-huh. down this notes for the hit man. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She doesn't know it's a hit man. And she's getting the yeah, crayon yeah. and everything. And then in the end, and, mm-hmm. I mean, we're just giving it away, but... Uh, John Cassavetes is coming to the door. He's basically pounding on the door of yeah. domesticity. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's pounding on it to be let in. Mm-hmm. But it's too late for him. It's too late. And they can't let him in. They have their child to protect. They have their life yeah. to protect. And what Stanley Kaufman is referring to is, it is devastating to see Peter Fox's face because he had already resigned himself that he was going to do this. He 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 was the Judas who who made a conscious decision. Mm-hmm made a conscious decision for the betterment of all. Well, he's also the reliable one with mm-hmm. Resnick. Yeah. Uh-huh. No matter, like, they might like to hang out with uh, mm-hmm. with uh, Nikki. Yeah. But Mikey's the one that they go to when they need shit done. Yeah. but And the, so they, when they call him to betray his friend, I think they know he's going to do yeah. it. And then the thing, yeah, and then the thing is also just, you know, uh, you know, the way it was set up is if Ned Betty had gotten to the bar in time... Mikey gets him in the bar, Mikey fingers him and gives the hitman the location. But he doesn't have to... To watch over the deed being done. He gets to escape and have it just happen in the background. But here, he has to cause it. He has to cause it at the end. And the cost of causing it is devastating. It's a devastating last close-up of Peter Falk. I mean, it's just, it's just terrific acting work from both men. And I think it's very really important to say that when it comes to John Cassavetes, because John Cassavetes was one of the powerhouse young actors of the 50s. He came out uh, at the same time after the, after Brando came out, there was a whole explosion of young actors, obviously James Dean, but also like Vic Morrow in uh, uh, Blackboard Jungle that were kind of, you know, angry young man taking the Brando thing. In the 60s, at some point, John Cassavetes obviously made a decision that when it came to being artistically fulfilled, acting wasn't going to do that for him anymore. And the way he was going to be artistically fulfilled was to be making movies and directing movies and directing them his way and doing them his way. That would be where his artistic fulfillment would come. And he's still an actor and he's still going to do good movies, but he's not, but that, but artistic fulfillment is not, is not his goal in that. It's simply to do good work and, and, and make money and usually to make money to put into his own movies. Yeah. It's not like he's bringing a heck of a lot of passion to the, yeah. you know, the the jobs, the gigs he's doing. However, having said that, John Cassavetes actually became one of the better genre actors of the late 60s and through the 70s and even in to the 80s. If he's hired to be the motorcycle gang leader in The Devil's Angels, mm-hmm. or if he's hired to be in the uh, Italian gangster movie uh, uh, Machine Gun McCabe, mm-hmm. do I think John Cassavetes will watch those movies? No, he's not going to watch them. He doesn't want to watch a, 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 a stupid motorcycle movie. But he's but he's still going to try to do as good a job as he possibly can for them. He knows what they want. And and, and, and and he wants to be a good actor. He wants to give, he's not going to kill himself, but he's going to deliver a good performance. He's very good as the villain in, in The Fury. And he's very good in The Incubus. You know, I love him in The Fury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. It took me a moment to actually register The Fury, that you were actually invoking the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you know how much I love that yeah. movie. I love him as the SWAT leader in uh, Two Minute Warning, all right? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Two Minute Warning. Nevertheless... The point being is they were two-dimensional portrayals in genre movies of more or less two-dimensional characters at best. The type of work he gives in Mikey and Nicky is not the work he gave any other director from 1965 on. And do you think that's partly because Peter Falk, his his brother in filmmaking, is there to help elevate him? To stand with him and basically match him? Well, I think Falk has a lot to do with it, but I also think he's responding to Elaine. Well, yeah. And I think he responds to the script. And he realized that this is not like any of the other movies that he had done uh, as an actor up until this time. This is the one... This is... I think the only, and he's given some terrific performances in some of these movies. I mean, he was nominated for an Oscar for The Dirty Dozen and he fucking deserved it. 
But there is a three-dimensional quality to his acting. There is a level of investment in his acting that is just not there in Two Minute Warning, and it's not there in Machine Gun McCabe, and it's not there in Capone, and it's not there in any of these other movies he does. And I even think maybe Peter Falk is even better. But to see John Cassavetes commit to acting in a way that you have not seen him commit, even in his own movies, all right, is just something to behold. And just actually, especially to see him and Falk working together. And I think that there is something about why she cast them. You're talking about Elaine May, who was part of one of the greatest comedy teams in the history of comedy, Mm -hmm. Nichols and May. And when she cast Mikey and Nikki, she looked for the dramatic equivalent of Nichols and May Mm -hmm. when it came to improvisation, when it came to uh, finishing each other's sentences, when it came to knowing what the other one was going to do before they were going to do it, and 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 then just handing it off like a potato. They are the dramatic equivalent of a Nichols and May. Well, now that you've said that, I mean, Nikki is obviously uh, Nichols. <laughs> and Mikey is obviously May. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. that's the dynamic you're, we're talking about. Actually, the dynamic, that dynamic formula still works uh-huh. <laughs> that you discussed. No, I could actually even hear. You uh, could, you could. I could that- hear Elaine May say, oh, Whenever you have a problem with a script, that's when you come to me. Yeah, that's when you come to when me. When you have a problem with the birdcage, that's when I get the call yeah, from you. That's when I get the knock on she the fucking doesn't, door. She doesn't even take. <laughs> she doesn't even take the acclaim. Yeah. She just does the work. One of the things that she told me that was interesting is you get the impression in the movie that Nikki has risen higher in the organization than Mikey is, which was part of my Monty Hellman, Jack Nicholson Mm -hmm. uh, uh, comparison. And then she goes, no, 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 no. She goes, no, it's not necessarily that uh, uh, Nikki is in a better situation with Resnick than Mikey is as far as like moving up in the business. It's just Nikki's beloved. Nick, Nikki's popular. He's funner to hang out You're with. You're not, Mikey's not popular. He he irritates He's Resnick. got that weird eye. He's yeah, like yeah. kind of a little bit of a schlebby guy. Yeah, yeah. He's married. He doesn't have a bunch of poontang, you know, set up in different apartment buildings. You know? <laughs> okay, so this is a review uh, from Sight and Sound Magazine on uh, the re-release of Mikey and Nikki that happened in the 80s. Sight and Sound was one of my very, very favorite um, Yeah, me too, actually. Magazines. Mikey and Nikki. Eight years late in entering British distribution, Elaine May's film spent half as long in production and emerged, with four cameramen and eight sound editors credited, bearing all the scars of its troubled and muddlesome gestation. But given that none of May's films have had a trouble-free passage, and that all bore witness to an original talent, peculiarly unaffected by any of the ruling notions of cinema, this is not necessarily a bad sign. Mikey and Nicky is many things. Some of them are already evident in A New Leaf and The Heartbreak Kid, and all of them in Extremis. It is a gangster film whose funny, sad gangsterisms, a hitman who can't find his way, a rather ulcerous godfather, are also a kind of realism. It is comedy whose dwaddling point, Nikki is Mikey's best friend and is setting him up for a hit, becomes crueler as it gets funnier. And it is a study of male camaraderie in which the freeform raggedness of John Cassavetes and Peter Fox playing both echoes Cassavetes' own films and turns on a reversal of sympathies as neat as in the most well-made play. Brilliant disillusion. It almost seems to be read with a British accent. <laughs> well, I'm not <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> well, when they say doddling. <laughs> That's my take on Mikey and Nicky. I think uh, a powerful, powerful movie that held up to repeated viewings. And I do not, uh, while I think there was a lot of interplay going on between Falk and Cassavetes, uh, uh, I do not think it is the improvisation thing that a lot of people have accused it of being. I actually think this is very literate material. It's a, it's a very strong, strong screenplay it's that written. one of the great writers of, of, of Hollywood cinema wrote. And it's a, it's a gem. You know, you, you mentioned uh, the false nature of the hitman in coma mm-hmm. and the highly realistic nature of the hitman in this Ned Beatty's character. Absolutely. The fact that he has shown up in town 
And like they, they mentioned bumbling on the box. Yeah, I, he's not a bumbler. He's not a bumbler at yeah, all. Yeah, he's, he's a funny. hitman. There, there is a he's com- Ned Beatty. There is a comic <laughs> aspect to Ned Beatty, but it's not that. It's only because he's realistic. He's from yeah. out of town. It's not. <laughs> it's not that of a bumbler. And 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 as comic as some of it is, none of it takes away from his lethalness. No, it's re- It's realistic. You all. He's always a threat. He's never not a threat. Yeah. But it maybe seems like the most realistic version of a hit situation that I've ever encountered in a movie. And especially the whole concept of, especially in the seventies of a hitman. Yeah. when you thought of the mob hiring a hitman, you know, you see Charles Bronson come off the airplane. You don't see Ned Beatty. You see Henry <laughs> Silva come off the yeah. airplane and they've got the high powered rifle with a big silencer at the end and the big yeah. scope and they're on the fucking roof <laughs> and they've got their little photos and shit. And it's, it's, uh, uh I mean, you say the word hitman to me, Henry Silva's face is what pops yeah. into my head. And if it's not Silva, it's fucking Bronson. Yeah. And then you got Ned Beatty here. <laughs> and it just takes the piss out of the whole thing without making it a joke. What's funny about it is it seems kind of workaday realistic. Bella, what did you think? So I watched this on Criterion Blu-ray. It is number 957 for any of you Criterion lovers out there. I have to give you and Quentin a thank you because I'm going to be honest. This movie was lost on me, like completely. I was lukewarm watching this. I was really interested in watching it because I've wanted to watch The Heartbreak Kid for like a year now and mm-hmm. just never got around to it. So I was like, ooh, Elaine May, I'm really excited. And I watched it, and I'm just like, uh, like, I don't know. Like, it's like it's okay. Like, I like the performances, and I can acknowledge, like, it's good. But I don't know. I just wasn't crazy about it. But listening to you guys talk about it, I'm like, wow, there is a lot that I missed while I'm watching this film. I mean, number one, that story that you told about Elaine May is super powerful. Like, the yeah. reasons why she's making this, the story behind it, I think it lends a lot to someone like me that maybe wasn't understanding of the material. Mm-hmm. And also just like the discussion of turning in your friend, knowing that you're going to do it. It's on his doorstep. Mm. Like it has to take place on his doorstep. (laughs) And what you guys said that like, it's basically a suburbia of holding him out. Like he's realized that this is the life that he should be living. Yeah. And he no longer is able to live this. He's meeting his the the very end that he's built his mm-hmm. entire life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Both yeah. of them are where... It's, it's, no, a, it's a kind said. of tragedy. I love it's what a, you said about you know, the, the, it's to, and the family you yeah, know, the, holding him out. And I just, you know, I love the thing. Like, I don't treat my wife the way you treat yours. When I'm going to be late or I'm going to be out all night, I call. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's also his wife holding him out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Because, because, I mean, and his wife doesn't want to. No, she doesn't know what the fuck's going on. She's yeah. disturbed. But yeah. it's, it's actually really powerful. So I thank you guys hmm. for enlightening me. Well, and no matter what, any director stepping in to these two guys in, in a movie like this, mm-hmm. that comes with a lot of baggage. And it takes a strong filmmaker yeah. to be able to navigate that and, well, to, came, and to stay true to the material. Well, you're right. It came with a lot of baggage. And I do think that baggage helped sink it. Yeah. <laughs> sink it in the 70s. It, uh, in its initial release. In its initial release. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Even the fact that that Elaine May didn't talk Jenna Rollins into playing Nikki's wife, yeah. but instead got Joyce Van Patten, who is fantastic in the movie. Yeah. Says one of the better lines in the film. They're, they're going to kill me. Well, when you steal people's money, they get mad. <laughs> 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 but then when they just kiss and they just break into each other's arms and they just give each other this passionate kiss, that was moving. That got me. I will say there's actually two moments in the movie I really like, which are both Peter Falk. I actually mm-hmm. really enjoy him in the movie. The first is when he's at the at the very beginning when he goes, I think it's like the pharmacy or whatever. Oh, the diner? The diner. Oh, I and love like, that. Give me the cream or I'll kill you because I'm crazy. <laughs> and it's just like, it's such, that was a really fun moment because it's funny because, I mean, I, yeah, he has to get him out of the apartment basically to kill him. But he's like having an ulcer. It's like, just like, let him suffer. At this yeah. at this time, it's like, he doesn't want his friend to suffer. He yeah. still wants to get him the well, cream. He's, he's going back and forth. He's like, he's he's got to do his job. He's mm-hmm. got to betray his friend. But he's also, it's his friend. Yeah. It's his friend. No, no, that, the scene with the cream and the 
disinterested counter guy. You know, that seems like a great Harvey Cattell scene from a from a Scorsese movie. And, right? it, yeah, <laughs> and, and it feels, whether it was or not, I don't know, but it feels spontaneous. Yeah. That moment where he hops the way he over the counter. he just swipes the donut case off the counter, hops over the counter, just yeah. strangling the it fuck looks out like, of the guy. It looks like he shocked that day player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I also really like the moment uh, when Nikki is with one of his many women. Mm-hmm. And when... Uh, Mikey is just sitting there, like kind of in the kitchen, oh, I awkwardly. Know, yeah. As the Nikki lighting, basically, we were... Nikki basically rapes mm-hmm. this woman, like on the couch, we, we and they're were... just kind of sitting there. It's like Last Supper, because he's he's been bringing guys there, yeah. to have sex with her multiple times. No, 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 no. He, he? No, he's told guy. He doesn't bring guys over there. He's let guys know that she puts out. Because then he tells Mikey to go. Try yeah, yeah. it with her, and she gets really mad yeah. that he's doing that. That's another one of his jokes, though. He's setting up his friend. He knows yeah. that she's going to, like... No, yeah, she's she's his piece on the side. You learn yeah. something new every day, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I will say is that this movie, in my opinion, is a clear inspiration for the Safdie brothers. I feel like mm. if they yeah, haven't watched this movie for some reason, I mean, they must have. It feels like the Safdie brothers have watched this movie and have taken a little bit from Elaine May into their films. And from mm-hmm. Cassavetes, for sure. And also, of course, from Cassavetes. I brought mine. It is a Warner Home Video for $14, and Video Archives originally got theirs for $69.99. Do you have a big old clamshell box? I think I do have the big old clamshell box, okay. it's, if I remember correctly. This box could not be more attractive. Yeah. It really could not be. <laughs> I can remember seeing that box, and I can remember exactly <laughs> where it was in the store, because mm-hmm. there was like that middle counter yeah. area for a while. Well, actually the store moved at one point, mm-hmm. but at two points, but uh, I can remember exactly where it's at. And I can remember looking at it almost every day. Mm-hmm. And I can remember Jerry telling me constantly, this is a really good movie. You've got to see this movie. Yeah. Jerry Martinez. I think me and Jerry and, and Mary even saw it together during the 84 re-release. That, that, yeah. I, it it must've been because he was pushing it hard on me. And it may have been because he was pushing it so hard that I rejected it <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Now, oddly enough, they, uh, uh, the Castle Hill poster, the the one sheet of it is different, and it's a really good one sheet. It's it's the image of the two of them sitting together in the bus when they're sitting next to each mm. other, but it's done like a photograph, and the photograph's ripped in half, oh. and, and it's spread apart, and the and of Mikey and Nikki is in the middle where the rip is. Yeah, I've seen that Which is yeah. fucking a wonderful title design. Yeah, it's great. Design. However, having said that, as much as I like that title design, I like this artwork better. Yeah. Water. You can drink it. You can swim in it, and if you're not careful, you can die in it. Piranha. Piranha, the deadliest flesh eaters of all. Their razor teeth can strip a man to bone in seconds. And now they're here in the lakes and rivers of America. Piranha, they'll eat you alive. From New World Pictures rated R under 17, not admitted without her. Piranha plays October 16th on glorious 35mm film at the new Beverly Cinema at 7165 Beverly Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. For further information, go to thenewbev.com. The new Beverly Cinema. Always on film. Always on film. Okay, and we're back. And now we do our third film, which is usually, it doesn't always have to be, but normally is our exploitation-y title that comes in third. And this time we're doing one of the biggest hits in the history of New World Pictures, Piranha, uh, directed by Joe Dante and written by John Sayles and starring Bradford Dillman, Heather Mendez, Kevin McCarthy, Paul Bartell, and uh, Dick Miller, and Barbara Steele. Now, we watched this on the Warner Home Video, which came out with a beautiful Warner Home Video for a long, long time. However, somewhere along the way, I've lost the gorgeous green clamshell of Piranha. So even though we watched the video, all right, I just don't have the box. So Roger will be reading the back of the DVD release of Piranha. And Roger, take it away. That's right. This is the back of the Shout Factory uh, um, DVD. Is this a Blu-ray or a DVD? This is a the Blu-ray. I mean, a, a DVD. Blu-ray, DVD. I should say, for the most part, Shot Factory does a really good job. No, and they do so, a damn good yeah, job. They do a really, really good job. They love the stuff that they do. Seems like we have the same taste as Shot Factory, too. <laughs> it I, goes yeah, a long way. <laughs> I think so. I've, I've talked to those guys, and they're great. <laughs> so, 
this begins very strangely though mm-hmm. from man who introduced us to J- <laughs> from man not from the man from man who introduced us to Jack Nicholson Francis Ford Coppola Jonathan Demme and Martin Scorsese Shot Factory is proud to present the new collector's edition of Roger Corman's most loved productions Joe Dante's cult classic Piranha is back in a new collector's edition with new special features and it has a lot of special features While searching for missing teenagers, novice skip tracer Maggie McCowan, Heather Menzies, and local town boozer Paul Grogan, Bradford Dillman, stumble upon a top-secret army laboratory conducting genetic experiments on a piranha fish for the purposes of developing biological warfare. When the deadly eating machines are accidentally released from the camp compound, they are seen heading downstream and consuming everything and anything in their path just when you thought it was safe to go back into the river, (laughs) not into the ocean, but into the river. Piranha features a stellar group of talent in front of, as well as behind the camera. A top-notch cast of cult stars includes Kevin McCarthy, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Barbara Steele from Black Sunday, Belinda Blasky, The Howling, Dick Miller, the great Dick Miller, (laughs) Bucket of Blood, and Paul Bartel. Rock and Roll High School. (laughs) Rock and Roll High School, Death Race 2000. Piranha is director Joe Dante's second film. He would go on to direct Gremlins and Small Soldiers. Producer John Davison went on to produce Blockbusters, Robocop, and Starship Troopers. An airplane, my God. Yeah, and airplane. (laughs) But I'm happy that they... Shot Factory knows that its audience cares (laughs) about uh, Starship Troopers and Robocop. (laughs) They know. Uh, the film also features a thrilling soundtrack by Pino DiNaggio, Dressed to Kill, Carrie, and Dante's The Howling. And it could easily have been the same uh, soundtrack mm. for all of those, <laughs> yeah. I just want to say, because... Well, it's, well, <laughs> well, especially the Carrie theme, all right? Yeah. Uh, every time uh, they show uh, Grogan's daughter, it's the Carrie theme playing. Um, Roger Corman made, a, made a, a statement, actually to me. He was talking about that um, when Jaws came out, And then Star Wars came out afterwards. He'd realized that, oh shit, the studios are doing the kind of movies I'm doing, but they're going to make them better. They they have the power to make them better than I could. Uh, We had the dynamic of the monster movie and we had the dynamic of this or that. But now if the studios are making that type of popcorn movie... They're going to they're gonna outclass us because we just won't be able to uh, uh, compete with that kind of thing. And for the most part, he's correct. The New World Pictures that work is not because they're offering just those kind of adventures. They, uh, it's usually their idiosyncratic sense of humor or you know, their sex or their, or their action or their violence. But especially when it came to New World Pictures, their idiosyncratic sense of humor. However, I think one of the times that... Uh, New World Pictures was able to go head to head with the big movies that it's it's competing against is in the case of Piranha. Now, I'm not saying Piranha is as good as Jaws because I actually think Jaws is the greatest movie ever made. Not the greatest film ever made, but what's supposed to be a movie, everything that a movie is supposed to be, Jaws you're, is. You're yeah. never going to get better than Jaws. Jaws is the pinnacle of that. It's I, the greatest movie ever made. Piranha is not the greatest movie ever made, but it's a pretty damn good fucking movie. And it's a magnificent Jaws ripoff. It's a fantastic Jaws ripoff. It's, and it's as fun. If you ask me, Piranha is as fun as almost any movie made in the 70s. It is a blast. I have seen... Piranha eight or nine times since it came out. And, you know, I'll probably see it three more times again and I'll enjoy it every single fucking time. Especially if, especially if I'm watching it with somebody who hasn't seen it before. Well, so much of that is Joe Dante and his yeah. bemused touch. Everything he touches feels... Mm. Well, he's such a smart aleck. <laughs> he's a little bit of a smart aleck, but that's kind of what I like about yeah, him. No, it's, yeah, no. Well, it's who he is. I mean, if you don't like that, you don't <laughs> like him. <Yeah. laughs> and he just makes it like, the movie is fun. Yeah, it's Joss isn't... I mean, Jaws Jaws is fucking fun. Yeah, I was going to say it's not fun, but the truth is Jaws is fun. But it's fun in a different kind of way. Piranha is fun in a a campier way. Yeah, no, no. But it manages the camp without it being stupid. It's it's, it's it's always on the... It always has the right touch of Mad Magazine to it. Totally. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you something. My wife, Gretchen, who you know... Yeah. uh, (laughs) 
you don't need to preface I, who you're talking about when you say your wife Gretchen. No, I was I was talking to Gala in that moment. <laughs> My wife, your mother. Yeah. I think I might know her. So I was describing a scene from uh, Piranha Tour, mm -hmm. and I started to cry. And I don't know if you noticed when we were watching the it. Paul Bartel scene. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I started crying yeah. while watching Piranha. I can't believe that I started crying watching Piranha. I'm a, mm -hmm. a little bit of a softie when, with movies, but mm -hmm. I never cried during Jaws. Mm -hmm. And there's that moment where Joe Dante does like the ultimate, which is he takes all children. It's all these little children in the water in this mm -hmm. lake. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, in a, in a river. Yeah. And the Piranhas come and they just start attacking people and they're just sucking them under and mm -hmm. they're just chewing them into pieces. They're, taking legs to the bone and they're uh, it's a feeding frenzy on children. And if that isn't shocking enough, you've had Paul Bartel's mm -hmm. character who is kind of that Dante camp kind of, uh, they explain his job, who he is. Okay. So he's the camp counselor. He's kind of like the, the, the goofy camp counselor. Okay. You kids, uh, you've got to go over here. He's like walking around. He's a little, he's Paul Bartel. He's a little goofy and overweight. And yeah. And he's like pompous and he's pompous a, and he's, he's a, and he's like kind of like, he, he's the, the, the jerky uh, disciplinarian at the camp who's stopping yeah. all the kids from having a good time. You've got to get in the water. And she's like, oh, I know, but I, she said I didn't have to. Get in the water now. Mm -hmm. You yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. Don't be a, don't be a, I can't remember how he talks her down, but yeah. it's hilarious. Don't be a talks, quitter. Uh, yeah, don't yeah, be yeah. a quitter. Mm -hmm. And he gets a call from um, Bradford Dillman, the, the, the town boozer. Hey, there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of piranha on the way. What are you, piranha? What are you, get out get of here. Get out of here. He hangs up the phone uh, yeah, yeah, on yeah, him. Sober, up, sober up, Grogan. <laughs> it hangs up on him. <laughs> So he's been sober up and fly right, Grogan. So he's been set up <laughs> as that kind of Jaws character who's ignoring everything that's kind of being yeah. told. Well, there's two of those in this movie. There's yeah, also yeah. Dick Smith, but yeah. he's set up as one of those kind of guys who's ignoring mm -hmm. all of the warning signs that are coming at him. And he's a little goofy and he's played for comedy mm -hmm. almost. Uh, a, yeah, complete character. Complete yeah, a, buffoon. a caricature. Caricature. And suddenly the attack on children happens. Mm -hmm. And he jumps into the water. Or I think maybe he falls into water, but he goes. No, he jumps in. No, he jumps in. He jumps in. in. It, the, the lake is full of piranhas and he is standing there waist deep in it, carrying yeah. children and out. When, as the piranhas are attacking him. And, and you know, it's, it's a super powerful moment because he makes. No, the, I, I, when the chips are down, Dante shows humanity. Mm -hmm. And though he's being freaking you know, flayed mm -hmm. by these piranhas who are uh, just nipping away at him and uh -huh. biting him all over his body. He's mm -hmm. pulling out as many kids as he can before he can't do it anymore. Yeah. And then Bradford Dillman, who has been trying to warn him. Yeah. Who gets there after everything after, has happened. After the chaos has happened and they're just people crying mm -hmm. everywhere. Children mm -hmm. in tears, half eaten everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he sees Paul Bartel and the moment comes where he's looking at Paul Bartel on the ground and he, and he wants- I'm just laughing at children half eaten <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, that's a good description, but that's, just, that's a fantastic sentence. <laughs> I'm so fucking there. I'm front row. He sees Paul Bartel, the two lock eyes, the two of them lock eyes. Yeah. And it's the moment where basically he would tell him, I told you so. Yeah. But he doesn't have to because he's already laying in front of a dead child. Yeah. And he's destroyed. Absolutely. And, and Paul Bartel, the look on Paul Bartel's face goes from like this goofy caricature where he's like literally mm -hmm. playing out of like porkies or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then suddenly he's filled with this kind of depth of human compassion and understanding and and devastation. Mm -hmm. And and there's all this death around him. And I was overwhelmed by it. Yeah. Now, I mean, even the shot of him on the ground by the child with like bites. Bleeding. All bleeding. Over. The look on his face. Well, it looks like Vietnam. I mean, yeah. it, lo it looks like, it, it, I mean, I, I actually think the imagery is, is almost meant to evoke Vietnam to some degree. And so I was trying to explain to Gretchen what the movie was like. Mm -hmm. And I started describing it and I started weeping mm -hmm. in that moment. Like it took me right back to the scene. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it occurred to me that what Dante does is he has a deft balance. Mm -hmm. Like he's, he's, he does the comedy that you need to do, but he also like when the chips are down, humanity is there. And mm -hmm. I've seen this in all of his movies or in many of his movies, mm -hmm. you know, cause like I'm a big fan of, you know, inner space. I love the burbs. Like I love explorers. I love explorers. Like I, yeah, you really like explorers. You were always a big fan yeah, of explorers. Yeah. yeah. Well, back when nobody else was, when uh, nobody else, loved, even I didn't like it back then. And I yeah. since come around. And so, I, yeah, I actually think gremlins to the new batch is a 
fucking masterpiece. Absolute <laughs> masterpiece. The greatest Mad Magazine ever turned into a film. All right. <laughs> I wonder if the DVD or the video has, because, you know, in Gremlins 2, there's a moment where the film burns. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And it burns. And they changed it on the video and they made it video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And I wonder what that is on the I DVD. I think they now. did. Not only did they do that, they actually did something like that in the novelization. Oh, really? In the novelization, when it gets to that part, the Gremlins attack the novelist. The paper. Yeah. <laughs> the Gremlins come in, attack the novelist, yank him off of the novel, lock him in the closet, and then Stripe, the lead Gremlin, goes on to apparently write a three page manifesto. <laughs> 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 Until the author gets out of the closet and chases the gremlins away and finishes the book. Oh my god, that sounds amazing! <laughs> but that's that's Dante. Like Dante will do stuff like that because, like, the fun is in the movies. He's just as emotional I'll tell, I'll and t- just as powerful as any other filmmaker doing you know real yeah. human emotions on screen. But he's also really super playful. He makes it a movie. I was able to interview Joe Dante on the set of Gremlins. I was able to meet him in his office. These are the days when you were like pretending to write a book and you would meet with all these directors. Yeah. Starting at, at the age of 17, I started getting in touch with the directors and told them I was writing a book. And uh, could I get together with them and meet with them and interview them? And knowing that directors are completely vain and would like, I'm in yeah. a book, right? Yeah, come and, and so talk I, to me. <laughs> and so I did this. I met a whole lot of directors and interviewed them. And one of them was... Joe Dante. And so um, when I'm meeting him at the office, uh, we're talking for a little bit and he goes, oh, you know what? I, I got to go and look at a, 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 a match shot, all right, that they're uh, testing out on me. You can come with me. Come come, come with me. All right. And, uh, and so he introduces me to a bunch of people. Um, and he goes, just going to have a seat. And so uh, it's like the closing shot of the little neighborhood from yeah. Gremlins and everything. It's Christmas time, so it's all snowy and everything. And, and it's like the camera's moving out and you see this moon and you see the sky and whatever. And so they, they're looking at the man. You go, yeah, that looks nice. And that looks this and da-da-da-da. And then somebody says something, well, you know you know what we could have? We, we could have a little Santa Claus and uh, the reindeers flying over the moon, you know, like in the background there. We could do that. And they're all ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. And then Joe Dunning goes, Okay, don't suggest shit like that to me unless you're prepared for me to do it. Because I'm liable to think that's a good idea and make you do it. <laughs> uh, um, one of the things that Roger just couldn't believe when we were watching the film, and it's hard for me to believe, is um, the majority, there were some exceptions, but the majority, the lion's share of all the movies coming out of New World Pictures, you know, they had two-week schedules. They were two weeks or, or, or two and a half weeks. Three weeks, that's a, that's a big production, all right? But, but like two and a half weeks. And, you know, and especially in the first half of the 70s, you know, the movies were like $180,000 or $200,000 or $220,000, $240,000. You know, if they're, they're getting to $300,000, that's, that's, that's getting to be too much. Yeah. The movie looks like they had six weeks and at least a half a million. Yeah. At least. I, I, I would even go beyond that because as I was oh, watching- no. You could say it cost $8 million if easily. it was done for Warner Brothers and you'd believe it. Now, they had more money- than they normally had because Corman sold the, uh, uh, I believe he sold to United Artists, the uh, uh, foreign rights. So that means that they probably, you know, uh, uh, you know they might have had a hundred or 200,000 uh, more dollars to make the movie and then probably a couple of weeks. I'm still guessing 400,000 at the most, at the highest. I mean, you've done low budget movies. Mm-hmm. I do low budget movies. Mm. I know what it takes to do what they did mm. in that film. And it is a Herculean task to achieve what they did. They're shooting on water. They're mm. shooting in lakes. Well, here's They're the shooting with hundreds of children. Well, here's the, okay. <laughs> it's, well, it's incredible. Okay here's, the, okay. here's the difference though. When you're talking about, they had three weeks to shoot the movie or four weeks to shoot the movie. You know, you're talking about the main production shoot. True. I'm positive. In fact, I know that when it came to Piranha, when it came to all the special effects, they just kept working on that after the shoot was over. They kept working on that again and again and again and again and again and again and again on little pools, you know, in in, uh, in Venice. 
I only have two problems with the whole movie. One is the problem that you have about the way the piranhas get l- loose in the ocean is, you know, is, is not elegant. Into the river. You <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the right. river, yeah. In the river. It's not elegant. It, 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 it doesn't serve the, our heroine. It doesn't serve our heroine. It does. They could have done better. They could have done better. Oh, hey, what's this? Okay, they 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 could have done better. It could have been. Right. They, they could have done anything. No, it, it had that kind of. Uh, don't don't throw push that. Yeah, <laughs> N- national treasure. Like, hey, what's this wheel? Let's turn it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing that I have a problem with is I really like. Bradford Dillman in the movie, and the, especially his first scene that he has with <laughs> Keenan Wynn. Yeah. He's really terrific. And I like Bradford Dillman when he's like stars in B movies. He kind of makes that 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 uh, uh, red flannel shirt, it almost makes it kind of iconic by the time you get to the end of the movie because he's yeah. worn it through the whole film. Uh, and it, you know, he's got his beard and he kind of looks, it looks virile. He looks a little sexy, which I'm not used to seeing Bradford Dillman look sexy. And then he has that over-enunciated way of talking through gritted teeth that makes him look like a B-movie Charlton Heston. Yeah. But like a good B-movie Charlton Heston. I, I liked him. I have a little bit of problem in the first half hour of the movie after setting him up as this kind of cool, virile, woodsy guy. Yeah, he's got a drinking problem. Who, who cares? That almost makes him seem cool like Hemingway or something. Yeah. Seems like he can hold like it. Like maybe he's a Hemingway-ish writer out there and just, you know, knocking him back as he's pounding out some bitter typewriter. Yeah. They make him kind of a doddering fool in the first half hour when he's with Heather Menez. And then now he's kind of puttering around behind her. And uh, I think it's an attempt to give him a, a character arc where yeah, he starts off as a drunk and he ends up as a yeah. hero. And uh, yeah, but he never even plays like a sober it. sober But hero. he never plays it as a drunk. He plays it like a writer who's yeah. just, you know, the bottle is as part of his yeah. life. He's never drunk. I don't, I don't even feel it anymore is the feeling. Yeah, like, yeah. He just, I can drink a whole bottle and it doesn't even affect and me. And the way he just keeps like sipping out, of it, it just seems like they're, they're emasculating him after they had set him up to be so virile they kind of you know the way he sips out of the uh, out of the canteen it just seems like it's an emasculating way when i actually thought he was just you know i thought he was very powerful the way he was set up in that scene with with keenan win now he gets it all back he gets it all back later once he gets on the river but that's my only my only problem but where i think the movie distinguishes itself as something impressive and dare i even say remarkable frankly you follow the, the piranha down the river and w- where we start learning where the piranha is heading is to a child's camp where that's a child camp based on the river. You know, we know this is where they're heading. Now, they're also, there's also a big resort going down. So they're gonna, the, the piranhas are going to hit the resort. But the hitting the resort is one thing. The fact that they put all these children in the river, all on inner tubes and all these chubby legs and all these chubby arms and all these chubby little fingers and chubby little toes and are just I feel like a, a, Dante a, a gleefully, sa- gleefully, <laughs> gleefully attacks their underarms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh there's no trepidation about setting up the children. It is gleeful. <laughs> the worst thing that could happen and it's relished. Yeah. It's relished and we're waiting for it to happen and waiting for it to happen and then it happens and that is one of the best edited sequences of 70s cinema. Dante was a terrific editor. He always considered himself an editor, especially back then. Yeah, but he stops editing. At, at Not a while. Point. Well, he's a director who always. Yeah. After, after the Howling, he he never edited again. I always wonder, like, well, he's such a good editor. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're a director and you also edit, you you you, you give some other guy the job, but you can do it. You can edit as well, much as you Well, it really want. served him on Piranha. Go ahead, continue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the editing technique is so amazing. You see Eisenstein in that sequence. Mm-hmm. You see Russ Meyer yeah, it's the in steps. Yeah. that sequence. It's all there. He is using every trick he has ever learned, and any all the tricks he learned doing uh, cutting New World trailers. Every little effect he's he's used it. Now, one of the reasons I think, and I, I think cinematically. It's his best accomplished sequence he's ever done. It's the most cinematically perfect sequence. And and I love the fact that it's not about the comedy other than just the gruesome black comedy of it all. Well, the Uh, comedy makes it ever more powerful. Yeah, yeah. Is uh the thing. But but, but, no, there's a reason it works so good. 
because I've read many interviews with Dante talking about the time making Piranha. And we all know Joe Dante's a smart aleck. All right. So if he watches your movie and it's like cheesy and the, and the, and the monster is a fucking rubber suit and you can see the, you know, he's going to joke about it. He's going to yeah. goof on it. Well, now he's stuck doing a movie that he doesn't have enough money to do the proper special effects. And now he's going to be the movie that everyone dumps on. And he will be damned if he lets that happen. And then he tries it and he thinks the stuff looks terrible. And then he tries this for the fish and he thinks it looks terrible. And so because out of fear of it being terrible, he worked harder on cutting the sequences and reshooting the fish and doing different things with the fish and trying different things with the fish. He did so many things again and again and again, not even to make it good, just to make it not bad as far as he was concerned. And he worked probably harder than he ever did cinematically. And he pulled off an editorial masterpiece, if you ask me. The fact that you can look at it and you can see this and you can see Eisenstein and Russ Meyer in those montages is kind of fucking amazing. No, and it's completely. right there. It's a phantasmagorical editorial masterpiece, those sequences. Yeah. I, I completely, completely. Tour de force. There's a couple of other genre editor directors that I love. And mm -hmm. one of them is George Romero, who mm -hmm. was famous as yeah, uh, yeah. editing. And what he would do is, you know, he would be editing and he's like, okay, we need this. Mm -hmm. And he would go out and shoot it and then yeah. put it in. And I, I got to know Don Coscarelli really well. And mm -hmm. he's the same thing. He mm -hmm. literally, he, he would shoot, then he leaves standing sets and he's got his editing room Robert right Rodriguez there. does the same thing. And, <laughs> and yeah, exactly. These kind of directors who are, they're, crafting it together and they know the, mm -hmm. the images and the sequences they're doing. I mean, it, it, well, Romero it, also had a thing. Romero didn't like to see his movies at speed. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. He liked, that. he liked to just do them on the rewinds. Yeah. All right. No, you, 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 you get too comfortable seeing them at speed too much. You know, no, no, you need to, you know, uh, do them at your own pace there. So he would just add tracks, add, just keep adding uh, 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 mag tracks. Yeah. And they're just, <laughs> just winding them, <laughs> winding them through the little box. <laughs> well, it's um, after after we saw this and we were talking about Eisenstein and the kind of mm. Eisenstein quality of that sequence. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. His craft and care into like making sure that every single cut has for maximum effect, whether mm. it's a little piranha. Biting uh, the fatty part of a little kid's arm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Going after the underarm. <laughs> it's such an intense scene. I mean, uh, look, a lot of people are going to watch it and just not feel anything. I imagine. I disagree. There's a reason why. I, it's mean, a I, I might be it's, building. I might be building it up too much. It's just that it really like. It look, delivers it, like dominoes. It delivers like the Odessa <laughs> step sequence is what it delivers like. You know, he really figured out mm -hmm. this shot, this fear reaction, this shot of people running, mm -hmm. this shot of someone falling, this shot of piranhas zooming through the water. Mm -hmm. Like it, it feels like a perfect rhythm. Gala. Okay, so someone in my film club is a huge James Cameron fan, mm -hmm. and he directed Piranha 2, which apparently he yes. has disowned. Yes. Completely. And they're like, oh, I want to watch Piranha 2 with me? And I said, well, have you ever seen Piranha before? And they're like, no, I, I've never seen Piranha before. I'm like, well, you have to watch Joe Dante's Piranha. Mm -hmm. So we planned a screening. This is fortuitous, but we planned a screening, and I had about five guys and a girl come, Man, it was such a blast. <laughs> I've seen Prana before. I saw it back in 2015, and I hadn't seen it since. I got to tell you, when those little kids are getting eaten, I got this one guy was saying, wait, are, are they are they actually going to eat the kids? <laughs> they're, wait, they're actually going to go attack the kids? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And we're watching that. Like, oh, my God. I can't believe they're actually attacking the kids. Yeah. The script is so good. Yeah, yeah. Sales it is, is one of the best so writers alive. Yeah. funny. There are so many good ends. Like Paul Bartel as Mr. Dumont, he, uh, the camp counselor, he says, people eat fish. Fish don't eat people. And his <laughs> line delivery that is just so funny. Well, he has that kind of Paul Bartel, mm -hmm. fish don't eat people. It's almost, uh, that was a terrible impersonation. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible Paul. I, I apologize. Well, My apologies like, to Paul Bartel. It sounded like Paul Bartel in, in Eating a Rule. Yeah, it sounded more like Freddie Stanellis. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> Look, the script is so good. There are so many one-liners. There's so many like emotional moments. Like you spoke about the, mm -hmm. the scene, the aftermath of the, the child murder. Yeah. But there's also the moment where the son and his dad are fishing on the river. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Yeah. And 
the dad says, don't get any closer. And he falls in and the kids like scream for his dad. And Mm -hmm. the kid's on the capsized boat. And when they save the kid and they have like the doctor who's been attacked by piranhas and they throw the doctor's body in because they realize like the blood is dripping in the water. And he says, don't throw him in. Mm -hmm. That's the piranhas are eating him. That's what they did to my dad. Yeah. And he's trying to get the dead body out as if it's like his father's body. And Mm -hmm. it's so heart wrenching that you're thinking just like. What is happening in this movie? I'm supposed to just be like, yay, piranhas, and I'm feeling, like, terrible. That Dante touch. Well, I think there's also a situation where if you see a decapitation in a movie, and the head goes flying off, well, you can enjoy it, and it seems like a movie because decapitations aren't part of your real life. So you, you put it in the context of a big spectacular thing that you would see in a movie. However, if you see somebody get a paper cut in a movie, you make a, yeah, because you know what a paper cut is. Yeah, the hangnail. <laughs> yeah, you Polanski, know. Polanski, I think, was the one who said yeah. this. You know, how that fe- you know how that feels. In Jaws, you can be scared of sharks, but you don't have this effect of, of, of maybe thinking you're going to get your leg bitten off. In a, it just seems like a movie. You know, it, it works the same way as the decapitation thing. Oh. But something about the little tiny razor teeth of a piranha, all right, sound, you know, the, I mean, that could almost be a rat biting you. And, and uh, but it seems like it would do more damage. And the, that seems like that hurts. That gets to you. So even something like when the dead guy on the, on the raft. Kevin McCarthy's w- character. Yeah, yeah. When his hand is just floating in the water and is bleeding. And then the way the piranhas are coming up and, and just getting bit. I mean, that fucking hurts. Yeah. That actually hurts. You in can way, identify it, with In the a way, horror. Jaws doesn't hurt. Yeah. All right. And the fact it's not about the throat or the eye or eating the uh, swallow. No, it's it's the hand. That's what's getting you. That's what's hurting. Is that it's a fucking hand or is a fucking little kid's toe. This scene was <laughs> that scene actually was not the substance of the scene, but the kind of setup for that scene was the one moment that I was bothered. And like yeah. the moment that didn't work for me was Kevin McCarthy's character kind of jumps into the water and swims to that kid. And I felt there was a better way to stage that. He could have, you know, could have. Just- yeah. We all try. We were trying to figure out like, why is What's- he swimming to the child? And at first I was like, Oh, maybe he's trying to lure the piranhas away. And then someone said, maybe he's trying to lure the piranhas towards the kid. Well- <laughs> and like, Oh, look at the kid instead of me. Well, I, don't the, I don't know why he luring them away from the kid would have been a legit thing. And being in the water to help the kid cross over from one boat to the other mm. is also well, all amazing. That, all that works. He, he, it's, did, it's he, just did it too, he did it too soon. He got he, he, he did, did it too soon. Okay, little, like I'd let the raft get a little closer to the canoe. A little <laughs> premature ejaculation. I don't know. Maybe he just couldn't stand living anymore because he had let the piranhas into the river, so he was committing suicide. No, he by didn't. Jumping in, he but did. I don't know. No, he didn't let the piranhas in okay, the river. You're yeah, right. Or, or she or did. Heroin, and yeah. I have to he say, he was pissed that she did. The yeah. moment that she lets the piranhas into the river is one of the funniest <laughs> moments in the movie. The dynamic. Oh, hey, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, we have to- oh my God, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, drain the tank. Uh, drain there's the a, tank. Pull that lever. <laughs> She's just, the dynamic between the two leads is such a good dynamic. Yeah. It's fun. It's fresh. She is really nosy, annoying, Typical, like, blonde, dumb know But she's an investigator. I loved but that about her. But she's an investigator, yeah. and she just kind of yeah, yeah. goes with it, and I yeah. like that. She's a go-getter. Now, she, by the way, you know, uh, uh, she's not just anybody, okay? Uh, us kids growing up in the 70s will all know her as from the TV show uh, Logan's Run. Yeah, Logan's Run. The, the TV yeah, the, version of the, of the uh Yeah, she played Jenny Agutter's character. Yeah, she plays the Jenny Agutter character. I just really like her character. I like that she just like opens up the thing. She doesn't care about anyone else. She just wants to find. Well, her she person. did have a reason, and that was she thought that there, the bodies to, would be at the bottom of the yeah, tank. She's yeah, not she thinking wants, it's full of. Uh, but you know, piranhas. Like, but but there's also the aspect though that I mean, everybody in this film is really good. I mean, even the two characters at the beginning before the credits to go swimming yeah. in the thing. You like them. I The girl especially. Yeah. I missed them when they went I out felt, of the picture. I, yeah, I felt bad when they died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also have to say, I love the little claymation in the no, government building. Don't. I don't know. It's never explained. That's it like another Dante touch. Well, they're that's doing biolog- a, no. It's a biological it's laboratory. Just a, it's just a Dante touch. Oh, that's what I mean, though. touch. He just, really fun. he just knew that he could, and so he did. And, yeah. it, and it doesn't care if anyone likes it or the, gets it or whatever. But, yeah. but what's interesting about that is he- He cre- just wanted to have a, a slot motion well, But second. he creates this little iguana creature character thing <laughs> that- is somewhat sentient and is kind of hiding like, it's kind of like hiding behind things and looking at them from hiding behind beakers, hiding behind beakers and stuff. It's kind of like, what the hell have they been doing at this place? It also has a little bit of that professor, uh, 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 Proteus, you know, from, uh, uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. All right. The, that's those little creatures, that that little, that little King creature. (laughs) (laughs) And it's those Dante touches. I love because 
when you say that um, Mr. Dumont is called to yeah. say, oh, there's piranhas coming down. He has a newspaper on him. I don't know if you guys noticed, <laughs> yeah. but it's the headlines say dog rips up newborn baby. <laughs> and, <laughs> I can't believe I'm laughing at that. <laughs> <laughs> and rattler bites team. <laughs> all of these like animals attacking Animals attacking people. people. Yeah, yeah. And he's reading this newspaper on all these animals attacking people. And he's ignoring and the he's warning. Ignoring of, the yeah. warning. Yeah. Yeah. And I, just, I love that. That's, like, a, that's an amazing thematic commentary. And it's such a good commentary. And I just love it. The last thing I have to say is, yes, the villain in the movie is the piranhas, mm-hmm. or maybe it's the government or mm-hmm. whatever. But the for, government. For, it's Barbara Steele. For me, it's the female scientist yeah, yeah. that yeah. comes. And I have to wonder, yeah, she has this great line where she says, some things are more important than a few people's lives. Yeah. And they respond, that's not what Dr. Hope thought. And she says, as I said, he was a dreamer. Yeah. It's such a great moment because you realize that that's her villainous intent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think... That's a sales, complete correct. sales idea. Yeah. yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they, she and the like, the original military doctor, yeah, seem like they're pretty friendly. I mean, she refers to him as, by a nickname first. Oh name. no, 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 it's implied. Were they dating? No, like, no, are no, they, no, like, no, in love? No, it's implied. Uh, well, implied, but they didn't actually say it. No, 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 they do. No, they do. Okay. They do. They do. Okay. I, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting Kevin McCarthy's first name, but he's always Doctor This, Doctor That. Yeah. And then like she goes, well, Doctor So and So. Well, Kevin was always a dreamer. Yeah. Kevin, we go back a long time, you know? <laughs> and it kind of just made me feel like, is she partially being evil because she just wants like him to burn? She was like his handler. Like guys like that, he may have been the dreamer who was, tr- or the the scientist who's, you know. And also, look. And, also, and then like, she comes and along and, and abuses a, him. And there's a tremendous amount of fun of Joe Dante being able to direct Barbara Steele. Because he is a huge Mario Baba yeah. fan. He loves Barbara Steele. And for him to actually be able to put her in a movie. He's putting cast, everybody he can into cool par- places. Keep yeah. And, win and like, every- and you know, and when he, when he cast Elizabeth Brooks later sure. as a, as a werewolf woman in The Howling, he cast her because she looks like Barbara fucking Steele. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter that Barbara Steele is not necessarily giving a good performance. You can't imagine the movie without her right? yeah. <laughs> because she. You just love her. Right? It doesn't matter if she's, she's not good. All right, you just kind of dig her playing the evil character with her that face of hers. And before anyone asks me, yes, Piranha Two, I would just skip it. Piranha is good as it is. You don't need to ruin it with Piranha 2. I bought a VHS of that for $19, Embassy Home Entertainment. Video Archives has a Piranha 2 for $5, bought Mm -hmm. in (laughs) $7.23.87. I bought my version of Piranha for $11. It is the 20th anniversary special edition. One thing I didn't mention, though, is uh, as if the children being eaten in a Piranha massacre is not enough, they they double down on that, and then they have the massacre that happens uh, at the at Dick Miller's resort, and and it, and the funniest line in the movie, which I saw the film at the Carson Twin Cinema, and it brought the house down when Dick Miller is there and his assistant comes over. Oh, we have a problem with the, <laughs> with the piranha. What's the problem with the damn piranha? They're eating the guests, sir. <laughs> 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 brought the house down, but then the movie's not finished. Okay, now what's going to happen is unless this waterway access is closed, the piranha are going to get out into the ocean. And if they get out into the ocean, then basically that's it for the ocean. Because the ocean is just going to be filled with these killer piranhas. There's be no more swimming ever again. That's that's gonna it's, it's gonna ruin. Yeah, they, something about the the lore of the movie is they breed in salt water. Yeah, yeah. They breed like crazy because in salt water. Because they were originally created to be sent to Vietnam, right? Yeah, yeah. To uh, destroy the rivers. Yeah, and you, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And they can go in salt water or clear water. Doesn't matter, like salmon. And so um, they got to race in front of the piranha to close the access, so they so the piranha don't get out to the ocean. Then it turns out that the, that access area is flooded and it's underwater. So now Bradford Dillman is going to have to dive down underwater and then, you know, turn the rusty fucking metal wheel. Yeah, Dante hasn't done enough. Let's now do a whole underwater sequence. Now he has to do a whole <laughs> underwater sequence and close it by turning it underwater. With a submerged house, which, by yeah. the way, this whole scene was like way better than- uh, Oh, Dario Argento's, Argento's uh, underwater yeah. uh, uh, haunted house sequence in Inferno. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. It looks fantastic. But the whole thing is they got to time it out. So they tie a rope around Bradford Dillman. And then he says, look, I'm going to go down. 
count to 100, and then after you get to 100, just take off. All right, because I won't be able to hold my breath any longer than that. And, and the you, rope will pull him and out. And the rope will, will pull me out and uh, it will yank me up. He goes down. And, it, and it's a fantastic sequence. He's just got to get through this house and find this wheel and then turn the wheel. Cuts back up to Heather Menez. She's like, you know. He's uh, holding his breath. Yeah. Yeah. And, she, yeah. and she's like, you know, 51, 52, 53. And then going back more. And they Here go come back, the piranhas. Go back, and the piranhas are on their way. They go back <laughs> to 64, 65. That is a suspense beat worthy of the original Jaws. Yeah. That is a really magnificent suspense beat. And when the piranhas get him while he's trying, you can't believe it. I even remember seeing it at the theater. Oh my God, they're getting him. What the fuck? Is this actually even happening? Wow. It just, I mean, that is a great, great suspense beat. It's a great action beat. It's, it's great underwater photography. The piranha shit looks amazing when they attack him. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you know, the stakes couldn't be higher in the way that you buy completely. What a movie. Yeah, it's really, a dynamite. What? It's a dynamite film. It's a dynamite picture. One weekend, we ran away. Let's hand out some awards. What do you say? Okay. Okay, so I'll start it off with talking. This about- is a tough one, actually. Yeah, oh, no, at least for two of these, it's a tough one for me because there's what I love and there's mm-hmm. what I recognize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like- well, uh, well, I mean, I love both, but well, this is well, this is a situation where all three movies are really good movies. Okay. Which one would you give the edge to? I want to say Piranha, mm-hmm. mostly because of Paul Bartel, weirdly mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like, of all things, that mm-hmm. scene with him, and that it really affected me the way that it does. However, despite its failings, I might go with Coma mm-hmm. as my favorite film. Of Coma these, of the group, yeah. Of the group. Mm-hmm. It's Just that it is like a Hollywood movie, and it's got all that... Cronenberg styling from mm. that time period and and it's a great thriller and I love Jean-Vierre Bichot. Mm. Okay, Gala? I'm expected to give it to Coma because Coma is one of my new favorite films, but in this aspect, I'm actually going to give it to Piranha. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, yeah, like I'm so close to giving it to Piranha, I feel like I made no, the, no, a no, wrong no. choice. You keep on giving it to Coma because I can give it to Piranha. Then. <laughs> I cannot feel guilty about saying that Coma is one of my new favorite films, but giving it to Piranha. Just talk, Piranha is so good that it's like about Piranha. It was just it was an exciting discussion. Yeah, it made me remember what I loved about the movie, and also they didn't have the resources that Coma had, mm-hmm. and they made such a good movie. Look. I'm going to give it to Mikey Nicky, but I think I might be a hypocrite because I think I might really, at the end, in my heart of hearts, actually think Piranha yeah. is better. And I know I will see Piranha many more times before I die <laughs> than I will Mikey and Nicky, but I'm going to I'm gonna go with the power of Mikey and Nicky. But, but I think any of these are good choices. I think the funny thing is all of us would probably, if our arms were bent, choose Piranha, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we had to watch one of these movies hey, right, right now, now yeah, let's watch it would be Piranha. Piranha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, best director. Oh, I'm going to go with Joe Dante. No problem mm-hmm. there. Absolutely Joe Dante. I'll go with Joe Dante. I will give Elaine May best screenplay, so that way I feel fine about giving, uh, I mean, there really is apples and oranges to, uh, describing them, but... Uh, yeah, I think best screenplay. Uh, yeah, I'll give I'll, I'll give Elaine May best screenplay because for it Mikey feels Nikki. improv. It feels improv, and we know that it's uh, yeah. that it's crafted. And I will, yeah, and it's a real piece of literature actually yeah. in its own way, and, and that makes me feel much better. And and no problem about giving a, a best director to Joe Tom. And it's a personal film that she that she held within her for sounds like decades. Mm-hmm. And how about you for screenplay or director? Uh, Best director, I'll give it to Joe Dante, and best screenplay, I will give it to Piranha as well. I I just think John Sales, yeah, yeah, John yeah. Sales. I just think it's such a funny script. Yeah, comedy does not always land, and they managed to make the massacre of children hilarious. Yeah, I agree. So, I, like, I like <laughs> you said that very well. And that's exactly what's funny about it. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> the terribleness is what's so funny. <laughs> I'm going to give uh, best cinematography to Victor Kemper. Because he did two movies here. Yes, absolutely. Did uh, Coma and And Mikey speaking and of which, something I was going to say earlier, and I think I got a little bit derailed, was the fact that Mikey and Nikki isn't shot like a John Cassavetes film. Now, oddly enough, it's shot quite a bit like a Paul Mazursky movie. It actually yeah, has the I see, given, I see what you're saying. It has yeah. the easy give and take of a Paul Mazursky mm-hmm. movie. And it even has, especially in the opening half hour, especially when they're- quality. Yeah. Especially when they're in the, in the, in the hotel room, it actually- 
has a bit of a, a Paul Morrissey look, but if Paul, sure. Mor- but Paul Morrissey on a budget, yeah. Paul Morrissey with a budget. Okay. Best actress. Well, for me, that's Jean Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easy. Yeah. Obviously. She's, Obviously. She's that's so, just straight down the fucking. Yeah. One scene line. alone. I, I could do that scene where she's hysterical talking to, uh, but she's wonderful throughout the entire movie. Okay. She delivers. Here's a tough one. Best actor. And you cannot choose both. No, I, I would only choose Peter Falk, actually. Oh, okay, and I'll tell really, you why. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell uh, you why. Uh, uh, Peter uh, Falk actually does a transformation over the movie mm-hmm. and reversals. Mm-hmm. Like, we, he's, he's, his character is layered in that way, whereas um, Nikki is just Nikki. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a dick. And that's all, uh, not all, but that's what uh, Cassavetes has to bring to it. Mm-hmm. The fact that Peter Falk's character undergoes this kind mm-hmm. of transformation and reversals throughout and, and that he's maintaining it and carrying it. Well, here, here and we, I just love him in it. Well, here we go. It's like because it's like I actually might think Peter Falk is maybe five percent better than John Cassavetes. Oh, it's by a hair. Yeah, yeah, that's a hair. But I'm gonna go with Cassavetes for all the reasons I explained before about sure. that. It's a depth that I ne- I had not seen him delve to in 20 years as a, as an actor peter falk going to the depths of where he's talking about is not new to me is right. not is not a once once in a decade situation yeah this was a once in a decade situation for cassavetes is this a lead actor or actor overall oh no lead actor okay lead actor i feel like michael douglas is just playing himself mm-hmm. so i'm gonna give it to peter falk even though I really like Michael Douglas in the movie. <laughs> I, also, it says something about him that he's willing to take that part mm-hmm. where it's almost second. It's, it is secondary to her. And what about best score? Do you think Jerry Goldsmith? And, oh, absolutely. Uh, or what about Pino Donaggio? Do you think it's just too much like other Pino Donaggio scores? No, I have no scores? problem with Pino. I think Pino Donaggio's score is terrific, but I actually in particularly like the coma score. It really pushes the movie. Yeah, along. it really I mean, pushes. No, it does a lot of work. It does a lot of work for the movie. Yeah. All right, the coma score. Best editing? Joe Dante, can, no, can we give well, it? Wow, the, wow, I just wanted to throw that out there. We have yeah, to give yeah. it to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to Absolutely. give it to Joe. Absolutely. Okay, but now. Best supporting actress. Uh, best supporting actor, rather. Okay, best. Paul support- Bartel. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, Paul Bartel. Okay, but let's say, let's let, let's talk about who the real three candidates are. Okay, there's like three candidates for that. All right, so you have Rip Torn. Okay. We talked about being great. Terrific. Terrific. Fantastic characterization characterization of a character we never ever get to know and there's still still so much characterization there and then you have everything that we've said about ned Beatty, which almost yeah ned Beatty. i i, I momentarily yeah you're which right. is almost counterintuitive how good ned Beatty is how funny he can be in this film without ever becoming a joke uh, and always remaining uh, uh 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 the threat that he's supposed to be his is definitely the best written character and he delivers the writing. Nevertheless, it's still Paul, Paul Bartel as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it is still Paul Bartel as far as I'm concerned. He he is fantastic in the movie. Paul Bartel made me feel things to the depths of my soul. <laughs> and that was very unexpected, let me tell you. <laughs> Best supporting female. Lois Child. <laughs> Look, I just love Lois Childs. When she's on screen, I light up. She's only there for a little bit. But when we, when we talk about Best Supporting Actress, who else really is there? Uh, Joyce Van Patten. Joyce Van Patten. Who, who, who wins for me, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. That's a good Joyce choice. Van Patten, the wife, Nikki's wife. And then there's also uh, oh. Nikki's, Nikki's chick that he's got uh, stashed. And yeah. Boy, what the... a thankless role that is. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough role and for an actress act- to she, deliver. She actually has one big, big hard to do scene after oh, another it's all right intense yeah. now, that, that actress she still- actually probably has the hardest job of everybody that we're talking and about. i don't know I still, her i don't know this actress i don't know i don't where recognize she her from? at all no she, she delivered comes in out of nowhere does this amazing performance I'm, i am not i am not familiar with her i don't recognize her but she uh but she was but that's one of the things i liked about it. i thought she was really wonderful i still give it to uh joyce van patten joyce van patten in the 70s like in bad news bears and all kinds of things she was actually she was a quiet powerhouse. Mm-hmm. When people who knew who she was, she fucking delivered and she was terrific. And it's great to see her have the Jenna Rollins role. And it's great to see her you know, carry that this much of the story and this much of the this much of the heart of the film. And then that fucking kiss at the end, it's moving, but it's also they're also sexy. It's also sexy when they just give each other that big passionate, I can't stop kissing you kind of kiss, because this is the last time I'm gonna see you. 
Also, there is the wonderful villainous. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I'm going to give it to uh, Barbara Seal. Just <laughs> <laughs> lifetime, achie- great, lifetime achievement award. She because, a, well, she plays a great villain, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess that wraps it up for another episode of Video Archives of the podcast. We'll see you next time, and just remember, be kind, rewind. Until next, when we meet. See you next time. The Video Archives podcast is hosted by Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery and produced by Josh Richmond and Gala Avery. Our engineer is Devin Torrey Bryant and our executive producers are Colin Anderson and Natalie Muella. This episode featured additional production by Raven Goldson. We now have Video Archives merch. Go to podswag.com to see everything we have in stock. Find out more about the show by heading to videoarchivespodcast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Video Archives and on Instagram at Video Archives Pod. Have you ever wanted to hear Mick Garris discuss the differences between original source material and the movies they become? Or Joe Russo's favorite gateways into horror? What about author Max Brooks and how he thinks that Minecraft will literally save humanity? Join me, reporter on the beat Gala Avery, as I get to the bottom of these topics on my new show, The Gala Show. In this weekly podcast, guests from Los Angeles and beyond have 30 minutes on the clock to bring whatever topic they want to the mic. So tune in every Thursday for a new guest with an entirely new topic. The first episode drops October 26th, available wherever you get your podcasts.